Welcome back again, everyone, to the Optimum Drive podcast. This is presented by the Fast Lane Talk, uh, which is just a huge YouTube channel. It's been doing so great. I'm so lucky to let them, uh, you know, or to have them host me. Uh, and this is only my, really my sixth podcast. Uh, you guys probably know me by now. My name is Paul Gerard, and uh, former Top Gear Stig racing driver, still race at Pikes Peak, do all that stuff, uh, all through the book Optimum Drive that's right there behind me. And uh, I'm so happy about this guest. This, this guy is, is a legend, literally a living legend in the sport. Um, I've known him for quite a while, not that long now. He's actually technically kind of my boss. Uh, so that, I think that's sort of interesting too. And uh, I've just had great conversations with him. I always followed him from afar because his racing career is, is so good. I mean, and he did so many things. He's, he's raced at Le Mans. He's raced at Bathurst. So Mount, Mount Panorama, which is one of the coolest racetracks, total bucket list for any real racing driver out there, though so few actually go do it. He did it and did well at it. Um, of course, is an IMSA legend, NASCAR driver, you name it, he's driven it, and he's been competitive and generally been at the front winning and winning championships doing it. So with, if you haven't figured it out by now, my guest today is the great Tommy Kendall. How are you, Tommy? Wow, that's quite the intro. Thank you, Paul. Um, very gracious, and uh, I'm looking forward to this. You know, we we've had we have a good time chopping up all kinds of subjects uh, when we work together, and now we're just going to uh, tape it. So uh, yeah, exactly. I, I love it. Usually, we do this leaning against a a pit wall, <laughs> typically, or something like that, <laughs> or in one of the shuttles on the way to the track, or a shuttle on the way to the track, or yeah. And and, and Tommy and I like we, Tommy is he's a, such a I mean. He's such an interesting guy. You're such an interesting guy from a perspective that you're very analytical and also very intellectual. And I think that that is, um, it's not that difficult with racing drivers. <laughs> Don't ruin my reputation here, Paul. Yeah, exactly. Analytical and intellectual. You're like, I'm a seat of the pants cowboy, man. Anything I've ever done in a car, I've never, ever given it an ounce of thought. You just like slip into your Ricky Bobby sort of um, persona, right? But, uh, but that's why, for, for me, I think I, I'm really going to enjoy this, Tommy, because, because obviously, like, Optimum Drive with my book, and again, this is not directly about my book. It's just relating to, you know, it's just one of, the, one of the things. But in my book, I like to talk about the difference between good and great and in, in generally and then specifically with racing drivers. And I find that a lot of drivers have a really hard time articulating why they're fast. Um, they just, they, they are, and they, they kind and they're also kind of superstitious. So they don't like to think about it too much. They're just like, I get in the car and it kind of works. So don't kind of prod too deeply there because I, I, you might mess something up and maybe next time I get in the car and start thinking about that and I'm not so fast anymore. Um, but I think you're one of those guys that's sort of so confident in your abilities and speed, Certainly, in the way that I, in the conversations again we've had, and seeing you interviewed and things like that, you're not one of those guys. Like you, you kind of know what you do when you get in the car. Um, you have refined it, you have honed it um, over the decades of of motorsports that you've been in, and again the variety of cars that you've driven. And I think that's what makes you such an exciting, you know, guest. Is is that I. I kind of I, I love your approach because you are much more open than a lot of race car drivers are about their craft. Um, and again, a lot of them aren't open because they just like I don't know, <laughs> you know. Well, I wasn't very open when I was still trying to earn a paycheck doing it. So. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so so take take us back. I, I I did do a little bit of research on you. I, I was kind of you know creeping on the Tommy Kendall Wikipedia page and a few other things. I watched you a little bit on. Uh, a couple of podcasts and um, just to kind of prepare for this. Cause again, I just want to really take advantage of having you here and really, and really get as much out of this as I can. And I saw that you were a second generation driver that your dad raced. So maybe start there with sort of how you kind of fell in love with driving and, and what your influences were early on. And then we'll kind of cruise through your career here, hitting the many highlights along the way. Well, as with all of us, my dad, was you know arguably the biggest influence in my life um but he was he, he didn't grow up doing it um he loved cars from when he was young grew up with no money and um his background he fought and scratched his way into a professional football career 
back oh. when it wasn't as big a business. He uh, very interesting. You know, he he wanted to go to UCLA, but he was playing in high school and he was he said, I'm too small. So he went into the service to buy himself time a couple of years, came in. He was number five on the depth chart. That's tailback at UCLA and uh, worked his way up to to being a starter. And uh, and then uh, didn't get drafted, uh, walked on with the Houston Oilers and a uh, couple key little moments, including asking for a shot, you know, um, and then and then delivering. So but with the car part of it, um, you know, when he started doing well uh, in business in his 40s, uh, we lived in a town called La Cunada, and our neighbor was a guy named Pete Smith, who was the Porsche dealer in North Hollywood. And uh, his son was my age. And so we were in Little League teams together. And Pete would always show up with the, the cool stuff. And so, you know, it's hard for people to remember what things were like back then. But if you lived in a suburb or a small town anywhere, really, there was three television channels. There was, you know, <laughs> a, two races a year on TV. There exactly. Was magazines, you know, and so forth. At the supermarket, you had Hot Rod and some of that. But none of these specialty things. The world wasn't at your fingertips like it is now. And so yeah. bottom line, if you didn't know someone who did it. It almost didn't exist in your world. I, I rode my dirt bike, my BMX bike and played with my evil can evil stuff. And, you know, <laughs> um, because that's all we got. Pete Smith started blowing my dad's ear about cars. And my dad started buying a few street cars. And he says, you know, you ought to buy a race car. And my dad's like, race car. What do you mean? I don't, I don't know how to race. And he said, well, you go to Bob Bondurant school and uh, they'll teach you. And, and here's the kicker. We all know. He's like, I'll drive your car until you're ready. <laughs> so Pete, Pete is no fool. <laughs> the entree. I yeah. mean, a chance meeting and a chance sort of deal oh, cool. and a uh, lightning strike. My dad, so my dad got the bug pretty heavy. Um, and then I went to Sears Point in 1980, in the summer of 80, to watch my, to watch Pete drive my dad's car. And my mind was just blown, wow. you know, I, I, I didn't really know it existed. You know, I was, I gravitated towards speed. We had a ski boat, we'd go to the river and I'd always find the guy with the fast boat and try to hitch a ride. And I loved, you know, and down in skiing, I always liked to go downhill and as fast as I could. But, um, now here was, I'm like organized auto racing. Oh my. And so this was the year of, uh, Ted field with Interscope and, uh, okay. Holberts and and uh, John Paul Senior and Junior and so that was what I was introduced through and my dad saw the look in my eyes and he's like wait a second this is not a career or a profession you can't make a living at this so you know just get good grades and we'll we'll have as much fun as we can and so that was the working deal but it's all I could think about from that point on and now the in terms of approach we'll get into a lot of this later but my dad's approach was always and it's funny when I was playing football. My dad was constantly trying to talk me out of playing football because he didn't want me doing it because he was doing it. And he just, but his adage was, if you're going to do something, give it everything you have. And so whatever it is. And, uh, and so that carried over and all my dad's obsession on fitness and training and all these things that he used to do. He was always leading edge for all the techniques of everything kind of rubbed off on me. Um, once I had an application for it. And, you know, when I got to my first race, right. and I was gassed and my forearms were pumped from the go-kart race. I'm like, OK, wait a second. And that was sort of the start of learning how to figure things out and get better and 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 uh, and just the cycle of continuous improvement. That's a, that's amazing. That's that's cool. I mean, it, it's really neat and hearing like, you know, dads. Right. And and how how they are. And, and you can kind of go on the surface. A lot of times we're like, you know, whatever dad's going to tell me, I'm going to do the opposite. We're going to be the contrarian. But then we kind of we think we're doing that, but usually what we're doing is we're learning, <laughs> and we end up kind of with a similar attitude and path and and uh, sensibilities and priorities and all of those things. You know, we in other words, you kind of can't shake it. You know, it, it's sort of ingrained in you. And whether it's nature or nurture, that's maybe a longer discussion than we want to have. But um, that's really cool. And I, remember, I I know the two races. It was Monaco and the Indy Five Hundred the two races that you could ever see on TV. Cause I was the same way, you know, I was like glued to the television twice a year. And you think about what we had. I remember when, when speed channel first hit, you know, and it was just like a 24 hour racing channel. It's like unbelievable, <laughs> but you're right. It was like whatever was around you in the neighborhood. And I was exactly the same way. I was racing BMX bikes. Um, I was doing all that same stuff. And, and uh, because that's, that's what we had at our fingertips. Like you said, and the magazines, that hit home, too, because, man, I used to, I, I, you know, it was until recently, till the Internet, when I say recently, but till the Internet, like every time I went to airport for a flight, I would sit there 
in the in the shop at the airport and read every damn car magazine they had. Yeah. Um, you know, while the, the clerk looked at me like, are you going to buy anything? I was like, no, <laughs> I'm just going to, I'm too cheap. I'm going to read them here. You know, but that, that was kind of like, um, yeah, that was our lives. And it was, it was a very different life. And, and you think about like these days, people getting, you know, the ability to sort of be exposed to literally anything that going on on the planet, any moment from a very early age and realizing, you know, there's carding when you're, you know, five or six years old, you can see that stuff and go, wow, oh, this is neat. Kids can do this. You know, where, um, you know, for us, it unless it was something serendipitous, like that happened with your dad, with with someone really wanting to drive a race car and thinking your dad would fund it. <laughs> old school. And, um, and now that I think about it, even before that, you know, my, my dad was into cars. And so, you know, we used to look at the classified ads and so forth. I found a book at my little La Cunata Oak Grove you know, library, my, you know, elementary school. And there was a little go-karting book, probably must've been from the sixties. And it was, and I, and it had some pictures in it and I was like, Oh wow. Those, and so, you know, yeah. my birthday is my mom was like, what do you want to do for your birthday? I says, I want to go go-karting. And it's like, where do you do that? I'm like, I don't know, but that's what I want to do. <laughs> that's and so super cool. It's uh, it's funny how, and I'm one of four boys, you know, and we were raised in the same exact environment, but I was the one that was car crazy. And so it's interesting with the exact same parents and the exact same influences. Some of us gravitate to this and some gravitate to that. But for me, it was lit. You know, I wanted to be on my dad's lap steering the car first. I wanted to drive. Uh, long before I went to that race, I taught myself because I, I knew how to work a clutch on a, on a, a bike. And so I said, the car, I, uh, we didn't have any manual cars at the time. And then my mom brought a VW bug home that was a loner while her car was in. And so I hopped in that baby when I was 12 and I, and I got it going, got it in the second gear. Then I had to stop and then I'd back up the driveway. And then I, you know, <laughs> and then, uh, then I finally got it pinned against the, the, the gate post and it was on a hill and I didn't know how to work the three pedals on a hill. So I just set the e-brake and said, mom, I can't. can't you just it left it jam. there, abandoned it. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's that's awesome. I I remember ripping around on a stupid tractor, like a lawn tractor, um, yeah. and I would reach over the hood of the thing to bypass the governor while I was driving it. So the steering wheel was basically against my chest, and I'm pulling it to full throttle past the governor, and it would spin one inside tire doing that. And then no you just, if you caught it just right, you could get it to sort of kick a little sideways. Meanwhile, the wheel's against my chest, and and my my brother had a. A, uh, he had two of them. He was five years older than me. He had a 67 Mini Cooper S, but it was it didn't have a motor in it. Like, it never ran, but it was on our back porch. And this is how light a Mini Cooper is. Without an engine in it, my friend and I, at, at, at like 10 years old, we used to take turns pushing each other around the yard in it. And then we would tuck it back up on the porch just perfectly so my brother couldn't tell we were doing it. But it was this blue Mini Cooper S, 67 Cooper S. And uh, we used to just push each other around the oak trees in my backyard in Virginia and then push it up. But that's how light that is. A 10-year-old could push wow. a 10-year-old steering. <laughs> so that's it's when just, you learned about uh, rolling resistance. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like if the, if the lawn was too soft from it, it rained recently. But, and then I, I did learn to drive at 12 years old, too. At that same age, my brother had a um, – and it's the opposite of a bug other than it was a manual. It was a, a 72 Chevelle – that was a total drag car. So it had a Muncie M22 four speed in it. It had two, a tunnel ram on a, on a, on a 396 big block Chevy sticking out of the hood, 456 gears. And, um, and I'm lurching around the neighborhood and that thing, the clutch, I could barely push at 12. Like I wasn't strong enough. It was an aftermarket, like McLeod, I believe clutch. I used to do work on that car all the time, but that was like my childhood too, is like whatever I could get my hands on that my brother was doing or, you know, watching my two races a year on, <laughs> on the ABC wide world of sports when they did Monaco and Indy. But yeah, it's funny that I, I, I think that's just, I think it's amazing. Like I want to just celebrate. I look back now and look at that childhood and realize like how lucky we were to have that sort of freedom and, and, uh, and not have access to everything right away. It may, I think it made everything that we could get our hands on that much more special in a way. And I think we've like we live with those passions through our whole lives because of that. Yeah, no question. And uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, you know, I love talking to people about everything, and people say, "Yeah, you're so down to earth about this stuff." And I said, "Well, I still remember being the kid that couldn't get enough of it." You know, and yeah. I, I'm still curious, and I still love 
even though I'm not active, I, I love trying to figure stuff out. Like when drifting came along, a lot of people in my sport said, Oh, that's stupid. I said, well, stupid. That's awesome. You know, look at that. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it's it, to each their own, but um, it's uh, it's a, it's a cool, cool world full of interesting stuff. If you're, if you're looking for it. Yeah. And like, like you were saying, like with the speedboat, like you were just attracted to the speed of the boat and, and, you know, it was sort of like, that's kind of your mindset. I was the same way with skiing. Like I love downhill skiing, still do, because of just how fast you could go. I found out recently that those Olympic skiers are doing three Gs through the corners just on their legs, which is kind of a crazy number, right? Because we, we know what that represents. That's a real race car that can do three Gs. With some, yeah. and, but that's what Olympic skiers do, three Gs. And, um, and you know, it's like so so. No wonder I was attracted to that, you know. <laughs> so yeah, well, we're, we're lucky. Some of the stuff we used to do that, you know, I remember one of my diggers I took, and this this cured me of my skiing speed bug. I used to just point them <laughs> down wherever I could. I had these new big long skis, and the snow was a little thin, and I was going, and I didn't, and I saw a, a, a thin spot, and I didn't want the rocks to hit my skis, and so I tried to pull up. Yeah. And, when I was kind of going down, one went that way, one went that way. And I I remember just these huge impacts, which was feet, head, and then air, quiet, <laughs> feet, head, air, feet, head. And I'm, I'm lucky I didn't break my neck, you know, yeah, and yeah. I was so sore for a week. And uh, it, it cured me of my, you know, however fast is not fast enough, on, at least on skis. Yeah, see, you're a lot smarter than I am because I've had all I've had those same crashes, and I'm still I, I got my season pass. I'm ready to go right now. <laughs> That's why I live in Colorado. But but yeah, skiing's a cool a cool one for that too. And it's you know I've actually had a chance. I had a chance to to train a couple of Olympians, Olympic skiers, and it, it was fascinating from a couple of different levels. First of all you know, using the analogy of the ski carving is so brilliant. And I've never stopped mm -hmm. using it since then because it resonated so well with them, how you would, you know, you weight the tip of the ski on initiation and then, then you want to be very centered when you're carving really hard. And then to accelerate out and be explosive, you lean back. And it, it's all little yeah. subtle variation, but it's no joke identical to what we do with a car, <laughs> you know? Right. And so I'm, I'm explaining that to a guy that Ted Ligety, who's won, who's won two gold medals in giant slalom, a brilliant guy, you'd love him, like same minds, exactly the same mindset, but he'd never driven a car around a track, happened to be at Sears Point uh, for Audi sports car experience, and I get to take him out and a couple of downhillers, and we go out and drive around the track, and it was two days of just magic because of the conversations and watching how fast they got fast and how they got right. it, like their eyes worked perfectly from the word go, like all those things, and then all it was was sort of – they just had to understand the new tool. It wasn't a ski, it was a car, but the principles are the same, and that is balance. You gotta balance the thing. If you balance it well, um, you can carry speed. And and then, of course, they get to play with a throttle. That's the thing they don't usually have. They just rely on gravity all the time. And they're like, oh, this is fun. It's like going from a dirt bike, uh, or sorry, from a, from a BMX bike to a dirt bike, and then getting a throttle. And you're like, oh, this is a whole other thing that I get to play with, where I have this un almost unlimited acceleration where on a, a pair of skis or on a on a bicycle it's just kind of what you can you can muster on your own you know but uh, but those are always fun and then the other part that was interesting too was they don't use data which i thought was incredible even at the olympic level and so i was talking to other them than, other than split times that's the only yeah thing they, they use, use video yeah. and 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 times and um and observation so it's still kind of a black or was then and so i was like have you ever put a strain gauge on your legs and the skis and the boots just to see the forces and looked at the torsional twisting of the ski and they relied on there was a guy that literally was a guy that was like in an austrian um shed up in the mountain somewhere in austria and he produced a fair percentage of the skis for decades that won the gold medals one guy and then the ski manufacturers would come along and actually pay to have their name put on his skis even though they weren't yeah. their production skis it's funny TFL right here, this building I'm in, the other half of this building is Head Skis. This is their U.S. headquarters. So um, they probably would love to jump in on this conversation. But, that, but that's the way skiing was, was sort of like this black art still, where in motorsports, we've been using data since, you know, early 80s and before then even, but it was in heavy use in the 80s. And, and incredibly, of course, in the 90s, and now it's 
ridiculous. They talk about the terabytes per time a Formula One car goes out that they pull off of those cars and it's beamed everywhere instantaneously, you know. But skiing, they're just, you know, it's the guy in the shed and <laughs> and they're ripping 3G turns, which is incredible, I thought, you know. Yeah, I, it's funny. It, it it really puts the premium on the guys that figure it out themselves, yeah. whereas having someone else figure it out and quantify, you know, it's, I, you know, to, to beat everybody else at any given time takes the same. You, you got to figure out how to do it better. Yeah. Uh, even if a lot of the information is spoon fed to you, I do miss, you know, the, you know, it was, there was data, but there wasn't the kind of data. There wasn't the simulation. There wasn't the, you know, the track, uh, views and so forth. So learning new tracks. I love street circuits where you would go and everybody's out there and you're all walking around on the Thursday. Yeah. The first session you saw who who could put it together the quickest, you know? And it was such a cool challenge. Um that isn't as much the case, but it's a different challenge. You gotta figure out some other way to be better than everyone else. Yeah, a lot of it a lot of it has gone into kind of from being these these big quantifiable chunks of, of advantage you could have onto someone where they can go and run it on a simulator and be pretty pretty tuned up by the time they get there, you're still looking for advantage, but you're way into the realm of diminishing return on that stuff. You're look instead of looking for yeah. for for tenths and more than that, you're looking for hundreds and thousands now. You know because everyone is on such a they can you can buy a pretty crazy level right now, and uh, you know you still it still comes down to people. That's the other thing. Like I think there's. There's way more dysfunctional teams than functional teams, um, you know, and, and it, it isn't budget dependent in a lot of cases. You know, you can have the scrappy, small, smart team can still do things. And and then, you well, know, you have funny. Big... And this goes back to I, I when I was playing basketball before I did car stuff, I went to John Wooden's camp uh, right over here at Pepperdine University. And, uh, you know, so I got to spend time with the Wizard of Westwood and. You know, there's legendary stories about, you know, that he's got his, you know, pyramid of success. And love it. One of the things he used to share is with, you know, when they were back to back to back to back to back NCAA champions, day one of the first practice, he would teach them how to put on their shoes and socks. And so here you have the best high school players in the country going, what is this? You know, now they, they listened because he had proven himself, but yeah. his whole point was, there's building blocks and there's fundamentals. I think there's what you just said about small teams doing it well. There's a lot of people that spend all this time on the really interesting, exciting, bleeding edge stuff, and they totally gloss over some of these basic fundamentals. Absolutely. That aren't. That's a you know, great. That's a great uh, lesson. My crew right chief there. used to talk about you know in terms of just pedal geometry with the brakes and the brake bias bar and. He says he would go to somebody's and everyone wants to talk about this and this setup and this geometry. He's like, uh, your 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 master cylinders, you're going over center, your 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 bias is migrating. He says, and those it's not sexy in alignment, same sort of way. Yes. There's a lot of people at a lot of races around the country, arguably pretty good teams, you think that know better, um, that aren't doing some of the fundamental stuff. Yeah, and it's and it's funny, that turns into a culture of of kind of not doing well on that team that they somehow embrace and it becomes who they are. And uh, it's kind of, I don't know, it's, it's horrible stuff, but it, 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 like I said, it's more common than not that there's something like that in the team where they get super protective of really bad setups. And you're like, have you ever tried this or this or this? And of course they're like, yeah, yeah, we tried that. And you're like, well, let me see the, let me see it. Like, you've got to have it somewhere. And they're like, well, I, I, okay, it wasn't actually me. It was the guy that used to do it, but he told me that didn't work. You know, you get, like, a lot of that hearsay and secondhand information, and it becomes, like, gospel in that team. Like, we don't ever talk against any of that stuff. And you're just like, aren't we here to try and win things? Like, why, why aren't you willing to experiment and, and do range tests on things and and, you know, and, and just like you said, like just pedal geometry, like how many race cars you got in the pedals are, are just in a, in a poor position, you know, mm -hmm. like vertically. And you're just like, this is awkward to push this pedal. Like it, I'm going to get a cramp doing this for two hours, you know? Well, so fun, I mean, I, I, I didn't have anything planned to talk about, but you said, I'd like to come away with sort of actionable insights. So that's one of them, you know, fundamentals of setup and car, car setup. But another one is some of the biggest gains I've made in my career, both on setup direction and driving styles, are when you can figure out where conventional wisdom is wrong. 
because like you said, it's just, it's not even questioned. It's just, okay, this is true. And then now we're trying to figure this mm-hmm. little bit out over here. Most of conventional wisdom, a lot of it, most of it's right. But there are areas where it's not, or it's based on a false assumption and if, if that changes. And so, you know, tires is, tires is a good example. Wow. You know, people yeah. talk about, well, you, a heat cycle does this, and a this does this. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't, but you need to dig into trying to really understand what's going on. Tires are still poorly understood, best I can tell. It's, it's, um, the, it's the truth. I mean, just go play iRacing and you figure that out. Like, they don't have a good tire model on that, on any of the sims. And it's yeah. very difficult to to have any sort of granular feel on a sim, you know, because, because that tire model. Now, you know... Um, while you are my boss on AMG Academy, I do other work. Um, and one of my big clients that I've had since the 90s is Michelin. And Michelin has a ridiculous tire model. But I always tell people it's like it's their Coca-Cola formula. They will never share it with anyone. You will not see this appear on iRacing ever. You know, and, and they, they, have it, they have it. I don't know who else has a tire model like that. It doesn't surprise me to hear that they have it. Yeah, and, and they build they build on it, and they can actually build, they can actually pop a tire out of a mold without ever running prototype versions of that tire, and they have like a, a 99% correlation on what was predicted that tire would do. And it, and it keeps getting better, and it's, of course, that it's that is so valuable to them. And I, I have a, another good friend. I don't know if you know him. Um, I might have him on the podcast if he'll come on, but he's a vehicle dynamicist, and his name's Claude Ruel. And, and Claude has trained a lot of F1 teams, engineers, so on and so forth, and he ha- happens to be here in Denver. But, um, but Claude has a software, a tire optimization software um, called Optimum Tire, and, um, and he has tried to, to take the tire and break it down sort of a la Michelin style, but Michelin uniquely has this crazy amount of data <laughs> from all the motorsports they have they continue to do and have done as they're you know sort of this juggernaut uh, in the tire industry and they're very engineering based and so that that's the kind of stuff where you're right we're trying to figure out those tires and I've I've talked to like Chris Baker who was the head of motorsports he was actually the first guy to read my book that's the guy I handed my book to the very first time and I said find things wrong with it because optimum drive is actually based on my my sort of epiphany was we're not driving to our style. We're not driving to the car. We're actually driving to the tire's needs. That's ultimately what we're doing when we're driving. And it is based on that. And you set the car up to the tire and you adapt your style to that, you know, not the other way around, which again, teams will go and do, you know, they'll, they'll say the tire, of course, it's a consumable. Why would I base my entire, uh, you know, existence upon a consumable item? And you're like, well, that consumable determines your success or failure. <laughs> You know, your ability to manage that that consumable thing you don't think is worth anything. It's funny you say that. I, I've never really shared this. I've never shared this widely. Um, Trans Am, which is where I did the, you know, had a huge chunk of my success, is what I'm best known for. It's a 100-mile sprint race formula. And so in the, the deal, it was a bias by tires for the longest time. Yeah. And so... The whole story was keeping the rear tires alive with the big power. And so my driving style in terms of not sliding um, was sort of, or, you know, the, the optimal amount of sliding, imperceptible amount of sliding, I guess. That's um, it. But I, one, in my stint with Roush, where we won those three titles in a row, and in the last year where we were almost unbeatable, it was just, you know, like you said, you're into the little tiny bits of gains and so forth. Everybody thought we had these big secret widgets that were ex- you know, they were looking for this big traction control system or this magic linkage or all these things. And and the reality is we were just really good, a little bit better at about eight or nine different things. One area of braking, we were a, a good bit better. better. You know, that was like 2% and 1% and all those other areas. But one of the things that I evolved was because the rear tires was such a limitation, I evolved our setup and my driving style to take more front tire out of it you know, in terms of carrying speed, yeah. leaning on the front tire on corner entry and mid corner and so forth, later to power, carrying a little bit of speed to the middle to shift some of that wear rather than ending the race with front tires in really good shape and rear tires that were ragged out, they were always going to be somewhat, but, and there were limitations to that, but it was something I'd never heard anyone else even talk about or was doing. And it was something we worked at 
I, I didn't even really share that idea with my crew guys. I just kind of, it was something I said, this makes sense. And so I knew what I was looking for to start the race with where the bars needed to be yeah. with a full yeah. tank and some of that stuff. But it was it, it, the thinking behind it for me was how can I take more out of the front tires um, to, to share the load with the rears. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the trick is, is like take more out of the front tires and, and gain, gain a little speed doing something unconventional kind of to your point. Like that's not how you would normally drive that car. That's not your qualifying lap in the car, but to do a hundred miles, you know, in, uh, on that set of tires. And the goal of course, is to end up at the, at the end of the race cross. It's like a drag racing top fuel car. Its goal is to melt a piston across the line. Um, you know, then, then they know they've thrown all the motor at the thing and it's done. It's 11,000 horsepower for three seconds and, you know, job done. We won, you know, hopefully if the thing hooked up and, and it's the same sort of thing is true in racing, whatever your race length is certainly with the tires, you know, and depending how open the formula is, maybe other parts of the car as well. Um, but you wanted it just to lo- get across the finish line and certainly the tires, you know, you don't want to show up at the finish with, with. 50% wear on your front tires and your, your rears are 105, you know, and, and cause you realize, like you, you think back and you go there, if I could figure out how to use those front tires, there's some speed there in that stint, you know, where now I'm using all four tires rather than just relying on the max grip of the rear for this hundred miles. And so like in your, like for me, I would, you know, you'd picture that in your head, like there's time loss there. Um, and unless I could, I, I need to show up at the finish line with all four tires e- with equal wear. That's as fast as that car could go. Well, I, I learned that I'll tell a story about how I learned it, but I also, this is a good point to sort of chime in, you know, we, we've been doing this for a long time. We've been thinking about this stuff for a long time it, for people that are tuning in where this is going over your heads, maybe and you're like, I want to share what I read a bunch of books before I started driving. Mark Donahue's unfair yeah. advantage, Carol Smith's tuned to win, prepare to win. And I remember thinking, I don't feel any of this. I'm like, it's all I can do to break reasonably late, turn in at that point. They say to turn in, clip that apex. I said, I'm maxed out just trying to do this basic. I said, I don't feel any of that. They asked me how did it feel. I'm like, I I don't know. So don't be discouraged. You want to be trying to feel it and you want to be, but don't be discouraged. This, this sport reveals itself to you in layers, you know, and it, like all sports at first, you're just trying to get the fundamentals. And once those become second nature, then you free up a little bit of the brain power and so forth. And so that leads to the story. My first ever Trans Am race was Long Beach Grand Prix. I'd been racing in GTU. I just won my first GTU championship and my dad bought an older Trans Am car. Uh, it was a very good one. It was Tom Gloy's my dad's MO was always he bought stuff when everybody was getting the new stuff. Yeah. And so it was always on sale. And so he bought Tom Goy's 84 championship car in at the end of 86 and when, when it was cheap. And so we went to Long Beach he's, and that was my first race. It was in this car and there was the new factory Mercours that Pruitt and Halsmer were driving. Yeah. There were the 911s, the turbo Porsches. They're not 911s, 944 turbos. So I show up there, I call, you know, I called as many people as I could, but I'd never driven anything with more than 330 horsepower. And so I show up there and I, I was good on street courses and I was young and all that stuff. Long story short, I qualified third and I'm running right behind Pruitt op- opening laps. And I'm like, I'm quicker than him. I've, I got him. I'm like, yeah. look at how much understeer he has. He's yeah. cooked. Well, yeah. guess what? I was out of sway bar. I was out of everything by about lap 10. <laughs> and... <laughs> <laughs> and Pruitt lapped the field. I finished second a lap down. To Pruitt. Wow. So, um, anyways, so I learned my lesson about how you want the car to be at the start of the race. And I, I, I you know, where I used to shoot for this thing with where my sway bars were at. I, I had almost all the adjustment was towards going looser. There was a little bit yeah. the other way, but very little. And yeah. so um, those are things that I worked out, but it was from a very painful lesson where I was, I mean, I, that car was, was, the rear tires were, were shot by, you know, probably 40% distance. Yeah, and, but they were glorious laps getting there. Or <laughs> yeah. you you were on top of the world going, I got this. <laughs> yeah, it's, oh man, I got this guy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I think we've, we've all had those moments. So you know what, it's funny, we, we went off into, on some really good tangents. We didn't get very far through what you'd done. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I I see how this is going, right? Um, yeah. So let's let's re- let's rewind for a second. Let's go back in to I you, I think you were <laughs> I think you were talking about basketball at UCLA. <laughs> Fundamental. That's yeah. where that's where that's where we went off, and we ended up in Trans Am. We just jumped like everything you've ever done. So, um, what after? You were at UCLA and your dad kind of held your feet to the fire and said, you need to get good grades and you need to kind of keep everything. Um, you know, you can do this racing thing, but you need to also in parallel, make sure that you, you get an education, right? And you were, what was your first official racing then? I heard you mention karting. So you, you went and did some karting, obviously. When were you doing that? I did that when I was, that was before college. I was 15. So it was a late start, even by that, okay. that day's standards. Yeah. Um, but I was in an enduro cart. Um, again, uh, John Hartman and Kathy Hartman, who were big in the enduros, really top-notch stuff, were just the next town over in Montrose. And so I ended up buying uh, my dad uh, when I was 15. I started racing the carts. And then back then, you couldn't race any cars until you were 18. The SCCA amateur license was 18. Everything else was 18. And then I found the, the school series, the Jim Russell School Series, was 16. And so um, I convinced my dad. I'd been to Bondra. I went to Russell. My neighbor was Jeff Krosnoff. I had two neighbors, Jeff Krosnoff and David Kudrave, mm-hmm. that were racing in the Russell Series. So that I kind of had some exposure to that. But so that so I went from cars. I got into uh, the Russell series, you know, I was probably, I was 17. I was, um, uh, but pre, uh, waiting for, rather than waiting for my SCCA amateur license. And so got a bunch of uh, seat time in the school series. Then the next year I ran a few pro races at the end of that year. And then when I was 18 was my big year. Uh, I kind of, my, I did a whole bunch of, a bunch of different stuff. I did four races in an older RX-7 that my dad bought, and I split with my brother Bart. I ran the whole Jim Russell Pro Series. And then uh, a guy, my brother, my dad didn't want to, actually, my dad let a guy named Max Jones be the third Mm -hmm. driver in our car at Sebring, and he bartered with him for some races in a showroom stock car. It was the Playboy Endurance Series and the Firehawk Series. And my dad drove the car once, and you know, showroom stock car that moved all over the place, was slow, (laughs) and had no brakes. He's like, you drive that. I don't want. I have There's a car you that. can slide so, around, Tommy. <laughs> that's where I met Max Jones, yeah. which was a thread that uh, was a big thread throughout my career. And he was running an independent Datsun repair shop out of a Long Beach called Datsun Alley. And so, in so I drove all those cars in '85, and then '86 I was going to do the same. Overheard a call that came into our shop. Um, our crew chief, I hear him say, yeah, Clayton. Yeah. Oh, hey, uh, no, don't know anyone. Yeah. Sorry. I'm like, who was that? I only knew one Clayton and that was Clayton Cunningham. who ran the, the Malibu Grand Prix team that had won the prior two GTU championships. The RX seven with the Malibu livery. I remember that car. Yeah. Yes. And he said, Baldwin just signed with Chevrolet and they need a driver and they're looking for a driver that has a little bit of funding. And I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, they had Mazda funding, they had Firestone funding and they were short a little stub. And so basically, long story short, what I was going to spend to run four races in my dad's car was what they were looking for to run 17 in the two-time championship winning car. Uh. And and so, but Mazda did not, was really against a young driver. I was 19 at this point. To show you how things changed, now they're obsessed. They're like, eight years old, perfect. <laughs> but, now, exactly. but back then, they were like, yeah, we don't like the idea of a young driver. So I was a third, I was a second driver or third driver, second driver at Daytona. Sebring, long story short, I did better than the guy that was supposed to get the ride at Miami in the sprint race. So after Sebring, I was leading the points and he couldn't come up with his money. Perfect. And so Love Mazda that. said, we still don't like the idea of a young driver, but he's leading the points. We'll go two races. And so I went two races, still leading the points. They said, we'll go two more races. Wow. And then I finally won two races. And then only at that point did they commit for the year. So so that became my first GTU championship. We had worked on the Dotson Alley program with Max, and we had a it was a really small team, but we had a really good effort going in Firehawk. And he and I won the Firehawk championship together that year, also. Um, so I was the youngest ever IMSA champion and the only two time champion in the same year until recently. I think someone might have done the same thing. That's cool. See, I I had no idea. That's a, that's an amazing statistic and that's cool. And both of those championships were very, very competitive. I mean, 
the the list of names in Firehawk, you know, alone and then GTU, but man, oh man, like all those guys were like buddies with all of them, right? And they're, you know, from the Boris Seds to the Peter Cunninghams and uh, Mark Dorsey Hutchins. Dorsey Schrader. Dorsey, and, uh, oh my God. Came up through there, yeah. Yeah, there's just, yep. just, just, and they're all characters, like every single one of them, and they've all gone on to be very successful too. I mean, just a lot of great careers came out of those years in, in those championships. So that's, and you're 19. That's, that's, that's pretty badass, man. 19. And it's funny because I, I'd done the Jim Russell school series. I'd done the pro series. I came within a point of winning that championship in 85 and Ken Twaits won my teammate. And yeah. uh, it's funny, all my guys that I raced with, we all wanted to rate the open wheel racers. And so yes. they were starting Same to get here. into Super V and Atlantic yeah. and all this stuff. And, and that was four times what I had to spend. Yes. And so that was just not an option. I, the sports cars were an avenue. I got the lucky break with the factory car. And I remember them giving me a hard time about one of them, giving me a hard time about, you know, the, those things are slow, the sedan, 300 horsepower Mazda. And I'm like, hey, it's a ride. And then I actually made some prize money that year and I got paid a thousand a weekend the next year. <laughs> and so yeah, I said, I'd rather be an in-work sports car guy than a guy that's dreaming about being an IndyCar driver that's short on budget and can't do anything. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, but I also learned a lot, you know, you say there's a lot of guys that can't really articulate what they're doing. When you drive different types of cars, you have to think about what you're doing yeah. because they're so different. And a showroom stock car was so different than a formula car and it's so different than a GT car. You really had to think about, okay, why does this work here? Why doesn't it work there? And that was the beginnings of me trying to understand what was going on and reading those books, talking about the mechanical component and Mark Donahue saying how that was his unfair advantage and 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 trying to cultivate that. And so, you know, the show them stock cars, no brakes. It's a little bit like, I suspect it's a little bit like fuel save. Yeah. Um, is now an Indy car. Uh, we weren't safe. worried about mileage, yeah. but I bet you we were getting pretty good mileage because we, we weren't able to use the brakes a lot. Um, yeah. and you had to figure out how to go fast yeah. without taking too much out of the brakes. Yeah. That, and, and all of it, like there's a lesson learned in all of it. I, it, it would have been, um, and again, like just the fact that I don't, I don't know if you really, you probably do, but like not many guys read unfair advantage, like our contemporaries, everyone knew it knew it existed, everyone, you know, and, and drive to win. And I, re I read all that stuff. Like, I read all of it. But I'm, I'm just, my point is, like, it's not, it's not typical of racing drivers to read racing books. I mean, I certainly learned with my, with my book, you got to kind of pull teeth to get people to read stuff. Because, again, your side of this, again, why I'm so excited to be able to sit here and chat with you, is it's an unusual perspective where you are like you you know why you're fast i'll go back to that like you absolutely know why and and you've come at it in these different championships you've come at it from different directions and all of all that does is it you learn a little bit from all those different things because they're all as we said they're all different and it confirms what works and what doesn't work and you see trends appearing after a while like you see patterns in the tea leaves like hmm that thing that worked on the trans am car let me try it on this car, you know, you've got, you've got this, this wisdom that's starting to kind of bubble up a little bit. Um, and I think, I think that's amazing. Just listening to you talk about it. Um, it's really, really cool. Again, how articulate you are about your success. That's cool. And it wasn't, and it certainly, that's amazing. Mazda made you almost go race to race. <laughs> I mean, yeah. you're probably, I mean, as a 19 year old, that's a lot of pressure, man. And plus, you're running in the Firehawk Championship in the same time. I mean, that's that's pretty cool that you you managed to to win that championship. First of all, like not not even like I did a respectable job and I finished six, you know fifth or sixth in the championship, and they were really impressed. Like you won the damn championship, <laughs> and you won races along the way to the championship, and you won the Firehawk Championship. So that's that's cool. There was a pivotal moment in that in that year that's where i met dan binks who became my crew chief for go. my whole career yeah and he was he's about i think he's three years older than me and so so binks was there he had just gotten there you know about six months before and he was made crew chief of that car and he tells the story that when clayton said that they were going to be paired with me his girlfriend at the time now wife sherry said oh you're screwed this is going to be the end of you <laughs> you know this kid with no experience and so uh, and Biggs and I, I mean, we have a, such a great relationship. Um, 
but he one of his strengths is he just shoots it to you dead straight. And so I remember after the Miami race, and in my dad's car, I had finished, I think, seventh and eighth in my two sprint races I did the year before. And so I finished fourth at Miami. And so Binks came up to me after he says, so uh, how was I? I said, that was awesome. He goes, that's not going to cut it. And I'm like, oh, okay, okay. And so it was just a huge wake up call that I need. And so it was, you, you got to figure, you got to be better every, every weekend. And so, you know, the analytical side, it's funny. I'd never really thought about it in terms of why you said there aren't many that way. It never occurred to me to be any other way. And I guess exactly. Yeah. It, it has to do with your early influences, yeah. you know? And so my dad being the way he was with the, how he approached things. And then my first couple heroes, one was Dennis Aussie who drove my dad's car and, and he used to work on the cars and I hear, and it was probably hearing him talk about the importance of understanding how the car worked. And that's probably who recommended that Donahue book to me, maybe. Yeah. And, and he, reading about Mark Donahue, um, you know, I, I read that book several times. And, and again, he was talking Greek about role centers and then I'm like, ah. I said, yeah. I don't understand any of that, but I, I, I know it's important. And yeah. so I hadn't really thought about why that was my approach, but it was, uh, I think that's probably why. And then, you know, it's funny how things work out. So driving the different cars, you know, show them stock car. I, I always, for my whole career, liked a car that was a little bit softer. And now it's harder. You got to really understand where the weight is going, like the ski, to where you're putting the weight. A lot of people just don't like that. And they just bolt the thing down. Yeah. But um, Terry Satchel, who was the Beretta designer, that I, the first Beretta I drove, he talked about how, you know, you actually lose grip the stiffer you go. Yes. Sometimes you need it. The more arrow you need it. It Compliance is king. Important. But yep. yeah. And so I've always favored cars that were only as stiff as they needed to be. Always. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's so I, funny. That's a nice to hear here. you say that. Yeah. That's. I mean, that's always been my my philosophy. And again, coming from where I, I always am bouncing things off Michelin all the time, um, because they are to me, like they are the resource where they'll, they'll, they kind of know and you know, you, you get so stiff that you start to use the sidewall as spring, you know, and it's like, it, it should never get to that point. Cause that's undamped. And, you know, mm -hmm. we've got some really sweet four ways on this thing and we should be using them, <laughs> you know? And, and yeah, I, I've, I've always been a big compliance guy and I always have thought of, you know, it's only ever as stiff as it needs to be to keep the tire happy. Um, you know, and that, and that's it. Anything stiffer only is done for aerodynamics. As soon as you start getting to aero platform, that's different, but the car absolutely su suffers mechanically as a result, but the lap time is better because there's enough fast corners to justify it on that particular track, you know? So, you know, it's always, it's always like that. I deal with that all the time at Pike's Peak. I have a super high downforce, um, high horsepower Pike's Peak car that I run that I don't know that you and I've ever talked much about it, but you know, it's a, 1800 pound thousand horsepower car with 7,000 pounds of downforce at 150 miles an hour. So it's like a, you know, it's like an old school GTP type car. And I hop in that every few years and run it up by speak and, you know, drive other cars in between. I race there every year, but that car I race every wow. few years and it, and it always like, you know, it gets your attention, but I'm, I'm really big there where I've got low speed hairpins that my min speed, you know, maybe 30, 31 miles an hour through these really tight first gear hairpins. And then a, a moment later, I'm banging through a, a series of 120 mile an hour sweepers where the thing's on the deck, you know, and all of that is, it's really cool to, you know, wrap your head around that. And it's literally taken me years to do, to understand how to drive that car. And, and I have, I have, you know, two guys from the, from the Alfa Romeo F1 team that have helped on that car since the beginning, uh, an aerodynamic aerodynamicist and a, and a kinematicist. And, um, so having those guys has really like, it's, it's, it's really expanded my, my understanding. And I, I, you know, I ran my fair share of F3 cars and formula cars with downforce and all of that. And I ran a couple of GTP cars and stuff. And so I get it, but man, it, it the compliance thing and, and not making the car too stiff. Um, that's such a fundamental thing because those cars are just not good to drive. Not only are they not fast, but they obviously kill the tires and they're snappy, um, everything you don't want in a car where, you know, especially when you think about it in the context of racecraft, where you want such a predictable, comfortable, you know, like an old set of loafers kind of car, um, to drive because you're, you're trying to outfox these guys, you know, and you're trying to manipulate them and you're trying to figure out how to get to the front and manage your tires at the same time, 
you know, better than they are trying to do that, you know, and, and all of that to have a stiff car while you're trying to do that. It's like, Ugh. you know, but yeah, everyone loves doing it. <laughs> like, woo. Well, you get back to these, these sort of sacred cows within teams in terms yeah, of exactly. and philosophies and yes. so forth. And now Europe, they, they, their tracks are smoother yes. and so forth, but, um, you, you know, I don't want to overgeneralize, but they, they tend to like their stuff stiff, <laughs> they really do. stiff. They so, do. Um, yeah, you know, there, there, there is some, you, you should, but you should do it just, not just for the sake of it. You know, it, the lower, lower cars get really efficient and so forth, but, yeah. um, not adapting that and knowing when it's time to abandon that is, uh, so, I mean, we all, none of us can be great at everything. So it's, you know, trying to understand uh, your, your weaknesses, the sweet spots. And, and, you know, some people just stick to one lane and they're like, this is what I do. I drive yeah. these cars and yeah. I drive this way. So that, that works too. We are, we are such creatures of habit, aren't we? And so if we find something that works like moderately well for us, that makes us competitive in this one little aspect of our lives, we tend to like go, well, I'll just move on now and I'll focus on something else. And we build, like to your point, a foundation, right? You 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 build a foundation like that, but it's it's and and you know to my book where it was the difference between good and great. You can build a good foundation like that, but not a great one. Um, and then and, you know, and then that's where you get into the whole culture thing within the teams, where you know, or even in drivers in their heads, where you know they're kind of they're kind of this mid pack you know entity for life because they don't have those foundations assembled as carefully as they should have or as thoughtfully or with less assumption, you know, is a, that's a good one. Like they make a lot of assumptions along the way. Again, you're basing it, like you were saying, you're basing it on what common knowledge is and what people assume, you know, works and doesn't work. And you've got to be willing to go out of your comfort zone and, you know, do those range tests and just be stupid and slow for a day, but eliminate a bunch of possibilities, um, you know, and, and there, and then therefore make moves more confidently forward because you have tried all these outlier things that everyone says doesn't work, you know. And I, I went through that. I go through that with that Pikes Peak car because that car, you have to run it, you know, pretty soft conventionally because it's not a billiard table. But the bottom is pretty smooth, but the top is in unbelievably bumpy. Um, and it's it's bumpier by a factor of like 100 over what the worst road is you've ever driven on. Because, you know, it's above 10, 12,000 feet and the, and the mountain frost heaves Every day and every night in the summer, it goes through a freeze-thaw cycle. And, and it's got a paved road on that, so it just breaks it apart, and they don't repave it every year. And, um, you know, all that. I was asking them why they couldn't shave it, like, you know, those laser shaving. I'm like, just do that every year. And they're like, There's not, we, they're like, we've researched that. There's not one of these trucks that can run at that altitude. And I'm like, oh, no, can we turbocharge one? <laughs> can we put nitrous on it? What can we do? <laughs> I won't, so interesting. Yeah, but it's like I never thought about that. But they're like, none of that equipment runs at this altitude. <laughs> like, you know, it, it huh. takes every bit of horsepower at, at, at sea level to be able to shave that road, and it, it can't do it up high, you know? Like, so we can't rent one of those. Huh. It won't work. But it, it is it's, – it's such a – it's so cool, isn't it? Because you think about the variables that we play with, and, you know, we, you try and keep – racing and, and and engineering the car and driving the car as simple as possible. But again, in, in, you can go too far in, in any direction. And there's certainly very quickly, there's too simple and there's certainly, you know, too complex at the same end of it. And, um, and I think that's what's such a cool challenge. I, I, I love the aspect. And I talked about this in the last podcast I did, but I, I was thinking about, you know, I was watching the Formula One race from Vegas and they were talking about the, Martin Brundle was talking about the athleticism of the drivers and, and sort of how they have personal trainers. And, you know, I, I think, you know, you know, with Drive to Survive now, I think people have an idea, more of an idea of that. Like, these guys are, are really good athletes. Like, they're on a, a competitive sort of triathlon level uh, of, of that's, that's how fit they are. They're not just people that are fit as a hobby. They're, they're fit as a requirement of the, you know, two hours in a Formula One car that can, you know, I remember at Port of Mile, the cars were doing six Gs cornering um, and and slightly over six in braking, where Port Mile is so flowy with fast corners, where there's some compre long compressions and you know 130 50 mile an hour corners, where there's a compression as well through the corner, and and I saw at Suzuka uh, the first Degna corner, which is a flat flat corner that's like a 45 degree kink, but I was watching. Sometimes they flash it up on that halo. They have the G force there. And on a flat corner, I saw 5.6 G. <laughs> on a flat corner. 
And I was just like, I wish they kept that G-force thing up all the time. They never have it where you really want to see it. But so that level of athleticism, so they're almost like a, Olympic level athletes, when you think of it like that, where they're, they're dedicating many hours a day just on being fit enough to drive the cars every day, seven days a week, all year round. And, and then on top of that, what makes, it, what makes motorsports so, to me, like mind-blowing amazing is that they're doing it in this un- incredibly co- you know, complicated car where there's, you know, 150 million official budget on, on these teams, but two cars, two cars that are run by 1,000 engineers, <laughs> you know, and they build everything down to every nut and bolt. You're like, they build it themselves. They, they only don't get the brakes. They don't get the wheels. You know, there's a f- only a few things on that car. They don't produce in-house for that vehicle. And I just, you, you, when you sit back, and it's like when someone explains how a top fuel dragster works, you know, it just blows your mind that, uh, from an engineering perspective, from a physics perspective, what's actually happening. But you just watch it on TV and you're like, oh yeah, they do zero to 337 miles an hour in three seconds. That's, that's fast. You know, that's like your response where if you realize like what was actually going on to make that happen. And I think Formula One's like that in a grander scale because of the athleticism of the drivers at any given moment because they're twiddling on steering wheels and making adjustments for literally every corner for differentials and all sorts of things on the wheel while they're subjected to those G-forces while they're under that kind of heat stress because it's so hot in the cockpits. And it's a two-hour athletic endeavor where if you think of a fighter pilot that, yeah, can do 10 Gs in an F-16 um, but they, they literally will only dogfight for minutes because that's as much fuel as you can carry uh, running military power in a fighter jet dogfighting. So they're, they're, yeah, they're pulling more G, and of course it's all vertical. There's a little bit of, you know. That, that's a key, key point I was going to point yeah. out is it's, it's all vertical. It's all um, vertical, yeah. So you don't have that longitudinal is, I mean, it's still, it's, lateral. It's still 10 Gs. It's still 10 but, Gs, yeah. I felt seven um, once in a stunt G, plane. It was a lot. Six G's lateral yeah. on a on a neck is. Mm. I mean, uh, here, here's the thing for even people that haven't raced, but people that go to your bed, lay, hang, lay on your bed on your side with your shoulder, and hang your head off, and put your helmet on, and that's one G. That's one. <laughs> that's one. That's one. And do that for about a minute. Yeah. And then. You know, load load that thing up with uh, with some more weight. Don't 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 go to six times what your head weighs. You know, but put a little weight on there. Yeah. It's it's something. It's it's really. But I think the you know, when you think about drive to survive, like it's made Formula One so popular. I don't think they have captured that. What I'm talking about right there. What we're talking about right now. Like you, you don't realize it. They're so happy and smiley, and they bounce out of the car after two hours. And yeah, they're a little sweaty, but they look okay. Uh, with the exception of was it yeah. um, the race? Uh, was it Bahrain or the one that was like three or four races ago where they, they were, yeah, they were, was there Bahrain. was heat exhaustion issues on that race. Cause it was a yeah. hundred degrees in the middle of the night there. But, but generally they look pretty good getting out of the cars, but that's the thing where I look at motorsports and, and think about like how outrageous it is at a, as a sport because of you're, you're carrying the reputation of a manufacturer. Car companies are still basically the largest companies in the world uh, as far as resources and all the things that they do, they're some of the biggest entities. They're still bigger than most or all the tech companies. Um, and so, you, you know, they're they're like counting on two guys to get things done for them that year. Like the pressure of that. I was talking about your pressure with Mazda and you're going race to race, which is true, by the way. Like as a 19-year-old, that's crazy. You know, but Max shows up at 17, you know, with a Formula One seat for Red Bull and you know, certainly not a car manufacturer, but a big global entity as a drinks manufacturer. And it's just, it's just cool. I, I just like to point that out, like how crazy complex and cool racing is at a professional level um, because of all of these different, you know, influences and factors that you have to deal with, uh, with you know, and, and then I, I haven't even mentioned, of course, there's risk involved where you, you know, and you certainly know that firsthand, uh, there's skin in the game. You can get really hurt doing this. And, um, and it, you know, it's, it's a, and that's that's weighing on your head as well. So it's it's really amazing. I think to your point where you were saying earlier how um, you know don't worry if you can't feel everything in the car right away. It takes time to kind of build that experience. And you think about that like that arc, you know, all the way up to being someone maybe that does make it into the top ranks of you know IndyCar, Formula One, IMSA, 
um, you know, the student Le Mans, all of that kind of stuff. It's, um, it's amazing. And I, I have nothing but respect. I did not make it that far uh, in my career. I'm, I'm lucky enough to have friends that have, I, I, acquaintances that I have. And, you know, I got up and tested a F3000 cars as far as I ever got um, and, and certainly had my own share of, of racing. I love it. But I, I just have a huge amount of respect for, for people like you that have really made a career of it and you've done it purely on merit. Um, you did it because, damn it, Tommy Kendall, you're good at it. Um, and that's, that's really cool. And, and again, when you think about racing relative to anything else you could have gone and done in your life, um, holy cow, man, that's a cool way to make a career and, and to race the cars you've raced. And to that point, so we made it through Firehawk. <laughs> you see what I'm doing now? GTU. Yeah, we made it through Firehawk. We made it through your first GTU championship. So what, and, and, and actually you start, you, you started talking about getting into a Trans Am car. So go from there. Like what, what happened next? Well, I won that for those two titles in 86. I got hired by the team. I didn't have to beg Mazda to race at the time. I got paid a thousand bucks a weekend and expenses for 87, won the title again in 87. Uh, and then in 88, I signed with Chevrolet for their new GTU program, which was what was significant about that. It was the first official factory GM race program um, in a long, long, long time. All the time up until then was all the cup stuff. Everything was backdoor. And so this was, there was a road car, the Beretta GTU, uh -huh. not, uh, not exactly a, uh, a Ferrari GTO, but uh, <laughs> it was, there was a partner car. It was promoted together. It was GTU. It was part of the nomenclature. So Herb Fischel kind of handpicked me to be, cool. and there was a series of guys that Herb sort of had. I was the first sort of hand-selected Herb Fischel project, if you will. And so 88, I did drove the Beretta and won the title again. It was supposed to be a two year program, but we won the title the first year. So they shifted and said, let's go Trans Am. Uh, so we moved to Trans Am in 89, uh, finished third in the championship. Uh, one of the only year, I guess, well, the only full year I ever did where I didn't win a race. So uh, 89 was, we finished third in the championship, but uh, we learned a lot about what we didn't know. And then the next year was the Riley designed uh, car, the new second gen Riley Trans Am car, the Beretta. And uh, I had a phenomenal year, won my first championship in Trans Am there with six wins. Wow. Uh, and then went straight to GTP after that. Uh, Chevy kind of joined forces with Jim Miller, which became Pratt and Miller. Um, and uh, he had Wayne Taylor, and they were doing a running a modified uh, Riley developed spice chassis. But he had this idea for his, you know, world beater from the ground up, super high downforce car. Yeah. So Jim said, let's build it and uh, and I'll develop it. And he was hoping to hand it off to Chevrolet for a full factory program. Anyway, so it was they were kind of merged in 91. Uh, Wayne was Jim's guy. So he got the first chassis. I was Chevy's guy. I didn't get my car until partway through the year. Um, but you know, that was my first year of GTP. I came out of the gate strong though, in the old, the old spice, pardon the pun. Uh, I <laughs> sat on the pole for my first, you know, regular GTP race at, at West Palm beach and came within a whisker of winning Miami. Knowing what I know now, I wouldn't have tolerated the level of blocking that Bocell put me through that guy. there on the streets of Miami that for the guy. last two laps. But oh boy. I was, I was new. I was kind of happy to be there. I'm like, <laughs> Oh, and then, uh, <laughs> And then I got the Intrepid uh, at Lime Rock, I guess, was the first race I had the Intrepid um, and came out of the gates blazing. One of the great weekends of my whole life, um, first race in that car. And talk about mind expanding with that level of downforce. I lowered the track record with the chicane at Lime Rock uh, by 2.2 seconds. That's ridiculous. And at Lime Rock, I remember being there in the GTU what, what car. What had the record before? What had it beforehand? Was it? Ah, uh, good question. Jag probably or the Nissan. Nissan. Probably the Nissan. So, I mean, that so had the it. Nissan and, was a, uh, a, a killer. I mean, an amazing performing car. Like oh, that yeah. car was world beater. Oh my god! Car. So it's for you to go two point how many? Two point two four. Two point two seconds two. quicker. And I remember being at Lime Rock in the GTU car, and they're saying you need to find a tenth and a half. I'm like. How do you find a tenth and a half at Lime Rock when you're already up against it? You know, so <laughs> two point two 
seconds. It's, and it's it was, like in, mo- in motorsports, it's like that 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 delta should occur over years of racing. That yeah. a car would go two point two two seconds. You'd probably look a decade to find that kind of time difference, and yeah. to do that from one year to the next is just. Well, it was when that car first came out, you know, and again, Wayne hadn't shown any real huge speed in the car um, yet, but. Um, so were you, you shocked then how fast driving. it was? Were you surprised how fast it was? No, because I had driven it a tiny bit in testing. And every time they let me in it, I said, this thing is ridiculous. But Wayne was, was Jim's guy. And so he got the guy. But Wayne was 35 years old. I was 24. And so <laughs> Wayne was sort of still locked into what can a GTP car do? And it, it was mind blowing what this car could do. And so he needed someone to show him a little bit what it could do once. I think it spooked him. It freaked him out early on and he didn't go any quicker than I was going in the spice. But then, uh, at that race, I, I lapped him like 40 minutes in. Wow. And then he, and then he hit me not on purpose, but he <laughs> drilled me. He was in third. I had lapped all everyone but Davy Jones and the Jag in second. Holy cow! And we the car wouldn't refire hot with the little battery. And so, anyways, from that point on, though, you know how it is when someone shows you where the time is. Oh the yeah. Driver. Can, oh yeah. Can then incorporate it. And so Wayne tuned up his act big time. Yeah. After that, and I imagine and, all uh, of it was in the fast corners, right? Like he was probably just fine in the low to mid speed. But just wasn't and, and the the braking and the braking the full carbon of brakes, course yeah and the braking yeah. hey uh, so, so I'm gonna guess so maybe I'm gonna guess going around Lime Rock in that car because I'm trying to imagine like again a high downforce car at Lime Rock um, certainly flat through West Bend after the chicane probably nearly flat to flat on the downhill just yeah. maybe maybe a breathe and a brush into Big Bend. And then slowing once you get in there, or a hard break in the well, you, you had to. I mean, you had a hard break. You were diagonally, I mean, like already turning, break and turn. No, you had a. You had to stab it a little bit, and then okay, but it was <laughs> it was but flat through from the chicane, so flat through West Bend, and and really basically flat through the downhill. I, I can see it. I can see it. And and I didn't watch qualifying, but. All the other cars were breaking at about the three marker, and I was breaking at about the one. And so my crew chief said Chip Robinson was down there watching <laughs> the single car. I and love he this. walked back, time over the loudspeaker, you know, two seconds quicker, and he's just shaking his head. He's like, "It's crazy. It's cra- yeah. yeah. It's a game changer. Is what it is, right? You, you yeah. hate using that term, but that's what it is. It's a game changer." And everybody thought that car. They say when they it showed up with that shovel-looking nose yeah. and the covered rear wheel. I said the same it thing. Was pretty kind of rude looking. Yeah. it wasn't. Sweet. It wasn't elegant. And everyone says, "Well, that'll work a few places." And arguably, Lime Rock is where it should work yeah. the best. And the street circuits, right? But yep. it worked virtually everywhere. Yeah. It was, you know, I got hurt already by that time. But Wayne was on the pole at Elkhart Lake. Yeah, in that car, which is crazy, so, right? Because the other cars yeah. are probably you know, top speed wise or 20, 30 miles an hour faster. And you're just, yeah. just killing them everywhere else. Well, the race I got hurt at, at the Glen, um, we ran the short course. So it was super fast, super, right. super fast. And Bernd Schneider was there in the Yoast Porsche. And he was running a single element center mount <laughs> rear wing. And I remember me being behind him in practice. And by the way, he came by me like I was tied to a stump. And the, the ends of that thing were bending down. He was 34 miles an hour faster through the traps at the Glen, <laughs> 212, and I was 178. Yet, if I hadn't made a mistake in qualifying, I would have been on the pole. That's crazy. So you, you like you were probably like 10 miles an hour faster than a Camel Lights car, and he and he was, yeah. but but you were you know so much quicker through everything else. Oh my god! Through turn five, I want to say I was. I mean, I was 15 miles an hour faster than Wayne through turn five. I think it was 20 plus miles an hour faster than the Porsches and all those guys. That's so badass. So, yeah, it was. And it was one of those things where it was a talk about a mind screw. And I, I was talking to myself, too, you know, because you're like, it, it just doesn't compute. And it just shows you like with Formula One and five and six G's, 
it's amazing what the the body and the mind can adjust to and slow down eventually. Yeah. And the limits you can get yourself to. But I remember thinking I can't go any faster. Then I'd kind of walk myself around. I said, "Was well, the car telling you it can't go any faster?" Yeah, it's you're your telling you, you yeah. can't go any faster. I call that. And I'd say, "Well, no, no, it's." And so it was. It was such an interesting, you know, and it's, and that was a even more dangerous time as that weekend even proved. But you're you're having to convince yourself, A, can I do it in theory? And then B, can I actually do it in reality right. and pull the trigger and send it? And, uh, and so it was, it was, I mean, everybody thinks I hate that car because I, you know, I walk with a limp because of it, but I, I don't, I mean, I, that was a rough, that was a rough go. Yeah. And it changed my life from yeah. that day forward. Yeah. I haven't run a step since then or snow skied or water skied or any of those things that I used to love to do. Um, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it either. I mean, it was such a stimulating, I mean, just to be part of that era at the very, very bleeding edge of it. You know, one of the stats in my career that I'm proudest of is any season that I ran a full season, I had more poles than anyone I raced against in every season, every season. And even there where I was out for half of the season, I still had the most poles for the year. And so I just love to try to extract the most from myself and, and from the car and in that car where there was real risk and it was, you know, uh, it was that much more uh, challenging, exhilarating and rewarding. And it was like a hub failure or something that you, because why you yeah. crashed, right? That's the cause of your crash. Hub, hub broke. Yeah. 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 Yep. Which is something in an aerodynamic car. I mean, I, I talk about that all the time with the, with the Pikes Peak car, just because the loads that go through that thing. Um, and yeah. especially if you're, if you hit an undulation or a ripple or, exit curb or things like that and spike yep. during all of that too it's like that's a mm, it's a lot it's a lot so uh, tell me something yep. tell me what your what was your process getting up to speed in that car when you first started driving it like how and and then subsequently when you went to a new track in it how did you find that limit in the high speed stuff what did you do it was just, I mean, just basically all incremental. You know, there was no simulators, any of that stuff. It was, you know, I, I knew all the tracks we went to really well from, from the years of GTU and Trans Am and all that stuff. So I knew all the tracks really well. I mean, I guess a street course like New Orleans, I didn't. But, um, and then it was, there was no fast stuff there. So it was just a matter of just, you know, incremental. And, um, you know, I had, I had driven some GTP races the year before, and I'd been in the spice car earlier in the year. Um, and so it was just a matter of, of, you know, feeling the car change when the, you know, the, from the really brittle, no compliance with no downforce. And then when you start getting some speed and you really get a feel it for working, that, yeah. it's the same stuff applies. I mean, the, the feeling at the limit is still the feeling at the limit, you know, um, and uh, you know, the consequences are greater and, and so forth. So you, you want to, you want to really approach it gradually in little fine shavings, but um, it's the same. It's the same. And uh, now one thing I just told the story recently to Marshall Pruitt for an article um, that was the, one of the first cars with power steering. And so I learned a ton about seats hmm. because I didn't realize how much I was bracing myself right. in the spice car with the steering effort in the high speed corners. I was actually holding myself in place when I got to Lime Rock and that thing had power steering, the first day of the test day, I was all over the place in the downhill because my, my body was moving so much. Isn't I was that, also left amazing. braking in yeah. that car, yeah, yeah. so I didn't have my foot pounded on the dead pedal either. So I really learned a lot about what they all do really well now. But you know, building the seats up and the side supports and all that, and I, I got I didn't realize how much energy I was yeah. spending yeah. holding myself in place. And pretty soon you get it. So the only energy is is holding the head up. Yeah. And, and it's, if you do your seat, seat, right. And being a tall guy, it was even worse because my knees were bent, which is a really long lever on my hip and all that. Um, so, uh, I, I, I learned a ton about seating that year. Yeah. That's really cool. And that's it, a, that's a big one too, being able to be lighter on the wheel. You know, once you kind of realized you could do that, the finesse you get out of that too, without having to be that, you know, locked in, you know, in the middle of a corner yeah. thing, M much. I mean, you think about flicking your wrist now versus moving your shoulders for an oversteer correction or something along those lines, right? Something I've talked about, you know, at uh, AMG Academy and so forth. It's hard to do because when your adrenaline's going, you're holding on so tight. But 
you know, when people ride with me, they always comment on how loose my grip is on the wheel yeah, and so yeah. forth. And so um, now when I'm out of the seat for a little while, I, I, I grip tighter like everybody else, but you, you become aware of it quicker. And I always say, try signing your name with your arm totally tense and tell me how fluid it is. That's a, that's a good and, one. I may steal that. And so <laughs> with, you know, with the steering in terms of being precise and feeling the feedback that's there, um, you, you need to, you need, ideally you want to be uh, loose and, and holding it gently. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. That's how you can, you know, that's how you, where you get your front end grip information from. And that's pretty, Pretty damn yep. important stuff. When you uh, on the with the car, like in the high speed stuff, let's say like turn five at Watkins Glen, or uh, or just any of those fast corners in that in the Intrepid. What was the balance like at the limit of the car? Um, was it progressive? Could you drive it at the limit? Was it understeery, oversteery? Was it neutral? Um, it was pretty good. I mean, it was it was you know. A hair of understeer, generally speaking. Yeah, um, which is normal, right? I do remember in qualifying there, um, I almost had the same crash just pushing it. Yeah, just from qualifying. going too hard. Yeah, yeah, as opposed um, to the failure. In, in all honesty, but basically, I was not. I was not getting at 178. I was not getting out of it almost until I popped the hill and was heading into the corner. Yeah. And so it was 178 with a minimum speed of, of 141. It's cool. And so it was like, it was like a brush to the brake. So you had weight transferred to the front. So I got, I got the back stepped out a little bit on entry in yeah. qualifying there. And that's a good feeling. huh? You know, you're, <laughs> you're scared afterwards. Yeah. You know? You're not scared you're like, at the time, but I found the limit. You're, you're like, oh, holy <laughs> Yeah, you know, I I like I like that. I think that, but if you think about like that moment, that feeling, that's almost as good as it gets. Like for driving a car, I agree. That's about as good as it gets. Is like on an entry of a really quick corner, having to to really kind of finesse the car in. You're like, whoo, this is fast. Yeah, most people never get to do it. No, because they can't get themselves to do it. They just Uh, won't. You know, and so. Um, you know, there's, 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 there's the difference between the ones that, that can do it and will do it and, and, you know, every, everyone else. But it's, it's like you said, though, incremental. And, and then also to your point where it, what I talk about a lot in, you know, one of the things that makes people plateau as drivers, but it's sort of perceived limits versus real limits. And, and mm-hmm. that's the problem with an aerodynamic car is like, you know, the mechanical grip limit we will all do it in a you know, at turn 11 at, at Sears Point, yeah, that's not a problem. You know, just don't bang the wall on the outside. But there's nothing scary about that, you know. And But then turn one, that's different. Or turn six, you know, that's that's different because now you've got arrow and, and the car now can corner, you know, 1.2, 1.5, 1.7, 2 times, 2.5 times, depending on how fast the corner is. It's got that much more grip. And rationally, you sit there and you're like, Okay, I get that. Yep, I see that nice linear scale with speed and downforce and G-force that will provide. But then you go out there, and I know you know this is the same thing. Like the first time I'll go through turn one there in an aerodynamic car, I'll do the same max G that I that I do in eleven, and then I just keep building, and then finally find the real limit in one, um, which is you know quite a bit higher. But that's kind of the way you know incrementally, just to your point. To me, actually, the other part braking is like the safe space to try it like because you know that brake application from a buck 50 like i won't be able to lock it if the tires are warm it won't lock you know and it's like i always use that that brake hit and and then how digressive the brake braking was down into turn 11 going okay well that's how much grip i have at 150 miles an hour whether it's braking or cornering that's how much grip i have and i would use i would use that the confidence under braking to, to go, the, the tires do have that much grip or it would have locked. So I can, I can try it in a corner now. Um, and so I always, that was my screwy logic that I still use to this day with the Pikes Peak car. It's funny. I do that. I do that with the rain. I used to do that with the rain. I would basically plot the track with the brake pedal on the, on the, just on the feel the grip with the brake pedal. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so I would try to, you know, give myself a, a grip matrix of where, where is their grip and so forth. So same sort of thing. I remember the outside of the carousel at road America, like the grip was awesome in the wet out there. Yeah. Like it was like, you yeah. could go almost like, it, it felt like double the grip, like almost on the outside at road America. Well, it's funny. Cause you talk about people that are kind of, 
you know, beat themselves. And uh, during our Trans Am run, um, I I went around the outside of Dorsey because they used to they were <laughs> doing a period where they were they were doing inversions of the top five. Oh, cool! You yeah. Know, yeah. After and uh, and I went around the outside of him in the carousel, and he was on the lock sideways, and I just drove around the outside of him. And and he's like, see, he's got traction control. And I'm like, Percy, <laughs> you've been doing this long enough. I said, I was I was not even scared out there. You know, it was like it was almost unfair. It was easy. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It was you were on the edge because there wasn't any room, but yeah, there was so much more grip. And I'm like, you sh- shame on you. You should know better, Doris. Yeah, of course, of course, Max did a pretty good clinic on that. I think it was Interlagos about two or three years ago when it rained. Mm-hmm. And he was the only one on rain line. And he just like, and he just drove circles around everyone, and everyone, everyone was talking about like how much confidence he had to drive offline. I'm like, no, the opposite. <laughs> like, like I, driving online is truly frightening. Like the confidence comes yeah. from driving offline. You know, it's like, I learned that exactly that way. My, I didn't grow up racing in the rain, so I was at Mid Ohio once, and. I went out and I didn't really know what to do. I, you know, I read some books and this and that, and, and I, I lost it. I'm like, oh my god, I'm crashing! And I got to the outside 18 it inches. It just and hooked it up. Yeah. <laughs> and then it happened like three or four times. And I kept going right back to the line, right back to the line. I'm like, wait a second. Maybe I should just drive where the grip is. Yeah. 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 And so, uh, yeah. It's like the but cushion people, on a dirt I guess, track. Will do it over and over and over, right? Yeah, I know, I know. It's it's so funny. It's so funny. You'll do the slide of death like every lap or just like three feet to the left. The, the car don't do yeah. that no more, you know. It just hooks up and goes. But, yeah, we are such creatures of habit. It's That's that phrase they use that you hear all the time now. The enemy that you know is better than the enemy you don't know. It's that. Mm-hmm. It's like you're, you, you know it's not ideal, but at least you know it. And so you'll right. stick with it. It's like how people stick in an abusive relationship. It's no different. It's like, yeah. it's a terrible situation, but they're like, well, maybe the next situation would be worse still. So I'll stay where I'm at. And, and we're amazing as human beings, our ability to normalize things, you know, like we're good at that. It's like, it, what let, it's what lets us adapt to the ridiculous speed of a race car and then hop into a road car and just be okay with how different they are. You know, so it's all of that, like in our minds, like how we... Sometimes it works in our favor, and sometimes it works against us. Well, it's, it, it's it, I'd never thought about both sides of that. That's very interesting, you know. But it it's funny you, you observe different people's approaches, and some people get to a really, really high level by just seeing someone do it and emulating it. Yeah. You know, and they've only driven this type of car the whole time. Yeah. I mean, literally all the way to the pinnacle to the top. Of, of the yeah. sport. And they're they're super skilled and they've got great feel, but they don't really understand everything. And they're just they're really finely rehearsed with a lot of skill and natural ability. Yeah. And then, you know, versus making some connections. And I think arguably to be a transcendent athlete, Tiger Woods. And for the first part of his career, it was it was mastering all the skills. But later on, once he had that, he's like, well, what if I could make this shot do this? And he would invent shots, you know, with or have a different club made because I want to try to do this. And that's when you get when you have that real understanding. Yeah. With all the re- thousands and thousands of that and natural aptitude. Um, that's where you get sort of the magic uh, transcendence. So gu- guess what? The first word of my book is the word is holistic. <laughs> And that's what holistic, holistic is. Yeah. Holistic, and I go into the definition of holistic. That's the first lines in my book, because holistic describes that you don't really understand something until you have one hundred percent understanding of all of the pieces that make it up. You know, that's the only time mm-hmm. where you really get it. And and so that's kind of like when you think of like holistic medicine. That's it's like all encompassing medicine, where it's like understanding the body, not just you know in in one particular aspect, but understanding it how it how it sort of, you know, goes out into the world and interacts. Like, you understand all of the influences, psychological, physiological, and physical. Like, all of it matters. When you tinker with one, you mess with the other two. It's it's right. like that. But that's like a good, someone that's good at doing race setup. You know, and uh, Steve Dynan, who I had in here, he's a good guy like that where he does whole setups. Like, and, and the Formula One guys do that too. They don't do the single change because they, they realize a single change will change everything. 
uh, you know, right. and, and so they have whole car change setups where they've already thought through, like if, if I complain about understeer in the entry of a mid-speed corner, he's got a whole setup change to fix that that already understood that if he, wow. he, if he just did a single bar or a shock change to fix that, that would have a, a knock-on effect on everything else negatively. So he doesn't optimize change for that. That, that takes wow. And that's what the F1 guys do. They do whole car swaps. Like it's an entire setup swap that makes the car like, so, right. you know, we, we always talk about, and I don't know, it, you're going to be something similar, uh, but this normally it's like slow, medium, fast, turn in mid corner exit. So you've got like, those are the phases and the types of corners that you're looking at. And then separately, you've got, you know, brake stability you might look at or different things like that. But generally hmm. slow corner, medium corner, fast corner, turn in mid corner exit. Like those are the phase, like engineer talk, you go back and forth between that. And so they're, they're doing those whole car swaps. Like, like I said, just you coming up going, I don't like it in this one thing. And they're, they're like, okay, right. here's how we fix that without ruining everything else. Um, and, and that's like, you know, when you're like, well, there's some next level stuff going on there. I was going to say that's, I thought earlier about AI, you know, the ability to, you know, to really crunch all of these different things in, permutation. in, a, in a much more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But the yeah. thing is, is remember like with AI, I always, you know, it's still, it's still, here's where we go off on a really bad tangent, by the way. Um, but it's still programmed by a person, you know, it, where, where it, yeah. it's, they're putting data in and it's choosing the next logical thing. That's what it's doing. And it's just culling that like unbelievably quickly. But I think, right. you know, like where, where AI is in this binary space, a really good engineer is in a three-dimensional, limitless space within their heads, and they're they're able to do well beyond that. And so you, I always said that they always said like you know what a, what about a driver like could we make a a computer driver car? I'm like no because what you really need because there's going to be a lost in translation. We could have you describe your method. You would be good at it actually, going into infinite detail what you do. Um, but then that computer program. You know, lost in translation between you and the computer programmer, the guy that's going to write the code for that. And, and so he would never be able to put what you do with the nuance. He would try and simplify it on some level, wouldn't he? Like he would try and simplify mm -hmm. it. He would go, okay, so generally what you're saying about this particular aspect, and you'd go, yeah, okay, okay. You know, you'd kind of agree just to get him to stop bothering you. You go, generally that's the case. But in your head, you have infinite variety on that generally one thing that he's trying to summarize and that's where experience is, you know, and, you, you know, I always say, like, human beings are like organic supercomputers. Like, we have this amazing capacity, but we're not binary. We're analog. And so for every one and zero, we have infinite steps in between. And that, that always will provide an advantage as long as we, you know, have the capacity and the ability to continue to learn. You know, you're still going to be able to do it. Like, chess is set moves. They can beat you at chess because it's set moves. The analog world is not set moves. It's infinite moves within infinite moves within infinite moves uh, in either direction, macro or micro, right? And, and so that's where we, we can still outthink them because we can go with moves between the moves, even though they can kick our ass at chess. Um, you know, it's, it's just different, right? The, you know, set moves in a game is very different than reality, which is 100% analog and, and, and granular to infinite detail. And... Um, well, and I, I've not worked with Adrian Newey. I did meet him finally. That's at, his brain, uh, exactly. <laughs> car week this week or this year. But you know, Tony Sicali, who was sort of, uh, who actually wasn't even a formally trained engineer, but won championships with Mario and Paul Tracy and Jack Villeneuve. And so what I, th what I suspect both of them are quite good at is they don't get bogged down in, in the minutia. Is they, they, and this is where I think a version, lower level version of driving all kinds of different kinds of cars or doing, being into different things. Like if you're totally into cooking, it probably helps you in racing process because you, know, you make these connections yeah, about and things way. and stuff. And so, um, you know, Nui, I get the idea that he, it's kind of this, all this cross pollination. And he's like, I think this is the area we really need to be focused on when yeah. you could spend the rest of your life focusing on that area or this one or, you know. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it becomes that holistic vision of, of like taking everything into account where he's got, you know, if they have a thousand engineers uh, at, at Red Bull, he, they, he has 999 under him. 
and and he sees he sees the whole car and yet then he sliced it up into 999 pieces for them to comprehend but he sees the whole thing working together you know and that's his that's his genius um, because he can keep the he can keep the ship on course like that you know if you have a guy on top that can't see the holistic view of what they're trying to do then they can get sidetracked and no one realizes it until they get to testing next spring and the car porpoises like crazy or whatever it does, you know, and everyone's scratching their heads going, we didn't see that coming, you know. But uh, it's funny, you know, I heard there were a couple of guys, aerodynamicists from the GTP area, when that when the whole porpoise thing, thing hit um, two years ago, there was a bunch of them that showed up on LinkedIn, a couple of friends of mine that ran GTP teams at Make, for all I know, were working with, with you guys. I don't know. But they were saying they'd already sorted porpoising, like they had it in the P cars and and had already sorted it. You know, by the by the third or fourth year they were racing in GTP, they had figured out how to not let the tunnels choke like that and um, and therefore make the car kind of stall, you know, continuously stall, which is what it is. Right. So I don't know if you had any experience uh, at all with, with that in the Intrepid. We, or we was... did. I mean, I, ex- I, I had a little bits of it, but it was not not a chronic problem. Yeah. You'd, have, you'd have a little experience of it. And yeah, it was violent, though. It was violent. Yeah, it's... Thing shut off. It, it, and watching it in F1, it looked like amateur hour for the first six months unless you were driving a Red Bull. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> it's like yeah. what the hell happened? Before? Is this the pinnacle of motorsports? And then... Thank, yeah. thank God they, yeah. they kind of gave them a little bit of leeway on the rules and, and they got it sorted because that was that was pretty embarrassing for a while. But that's some crazy stuff. But I think that's it's all cool, you know, when you think about, you know, all of these topics. And, you know, you were saying, you know, thinking about cooking. And I was thinking about, you know, I was talking earlier about the, the guy in the shed in Austria building these world championships because he holistically sees what it takes to build one of these skis. He understands it and he doesn't share it with anybody, you know, uh, until someone goes and and, and puts all of the data on the ski and then tries to maybe break it down into a, n- enough detail that they can actually process out what makes his skis so great, you know. But that's always the challenge, I think, in any sport. And, and, and to my point, I was trying to make earlier about motorsports. Like, we have such a complex tool that we're working with um, where it does take, you know, this crazy level of engineering might and then, of course, it's just a human being driving the car in the end, you know, with, for all our pluses and minuses, you know. <laughs> and and uh, wow. I, I think that's I, – I would imagine – and I, I thought of this when I was reading about you last night a little bit doing my research here. But just at your approach, you must have been a bit of an engineer's dream. Like, did they generally – and I know you hate talk, saying nice things about yourself, so I'm putting you on the spot here – but did they really like working with you? In my world, I would say they would be thrilled to have you as a driver. Yeah, I, I mean, I think they liked because I was curious because, like, when we first got into sh- shock development with Kurt Roerig and so forth, I, and the dinos and so forth, I want I was so curious. I wanted to understand how it worked, and, and so I'm pretty good at sort of grasping the the gist of it quickly. And that's kind of what I need to know as the driver, you know, how does this interplay in yes. the whole system? I don't need to know about what this washer stack does to this part of the curve. I don't need to know that, but I need to know that it can be affected, you know? And so they did seem to like it. I, I did have one engineer, Doug Louth, who uh, was worked with us. And then his little two man company, he and Lynn Bishop were purchased by Pratt and Miller and he, you know, fast forward after I stopped 10 years later, he was running a 75 person engineering department that, over, that had its foot in Chevy's IndyCar stuff, their NASCAR stuff and their all their sports car stuff. And Doug, we call him Doogie. Doug uh, came to me, says, you know, you, you did something that and this this isn't really what you're talking about, but it, uh, it was in the it's a little different now, I guess that maybe it wouldn't be as useful. Maybe it probably would be. Maybe, but with all the engineering and these holistic setups that they throw on and off. But he said to me, he says, you used to do something at the end of every debrief that was so useful. And I've never seen, heard another driver do it. And he'd say, you'd go through this and same thing. You, you talk about the, all the phases of every corner, 14 corners on the track and so forth. And, and your professional complainers, all you're doing is complaining about all of it. <laughs> and so you can easily go down the rabbit hole trying to fix anything on that map that you just complained about. I'd say, after going through it all, I'd say, this is what I'm feeling, but 
this is what if you fix this, this will be the best. Right. This will be the biggest right. yield. You'd summarize and it. And he for said him. you would point us, you would you would filter out the highest value piece of it. You know, because you know, I used to say, I think about it, I do you could make this problem a hundred percent better and it's no faster. And you could make this problem five percent better and it's two tenths faster. And so he said that was something I didn't fully appreciate at the time. And I didn't really even realize I was doing it, but I, I've always, in everything I've always done, whether it's investing and so forth, I want to know what's, what's, what's important, what matters, what, what is, what is, what is limiting this, what, it, what drives outsized performance. And so um, I would, and it's probably a function of all of that stuff, but um, so I didn't really answer your question. Um, no, no, but I, I, I that, that's I, that's pretty brilliant though, because it, it is it is so cool to think about uh, again, sort of applied like what a driver can bring to the equation, because it's it's there are so many things that can be changed, and and to your point, I loved when you said. Here's the thing you could fix 100% of it and it wouldn't make the car faster. Here's the thing where you could fix, you know, 20% of it and you gain two tenths. I mean, Tommy, that's pretty freaking brilliant right there, buddy. <laughs> and, and so I could see why he was really happy with that because, you know, they're faced with it. And, and that's the thing about the whole thing where we talk about like how dysfunction happens within a team. It is, it is not being able to differentiate between those things and then getting proud of stuff that isn't important. You know what I mean? Like, like that becomes yeah. like your thing. Like, oh, we always talk about this. And you know how they and it, very often in teams, it becomes antagonistic between the driver or drivers and the engineering department because they're like, the driver, he may be pretty quick and he has a pretty great resume and everything, but he doesn't know what's important on a race car, you know? And you're just like, right. Right. what the hell? You know, so it, it is like breaking through those barriers and trying to have a functional relationship or respectful relationship between the engineer and the driver, that's the essence of success of any team. And yeah. I think the way you're phrasing that stuff in a debrief, like that, my, my, my suspicion confirmed engineers dream, Tommy Kendall, <laughs> you know, as long as they had the, the self-confidence to be okay with you telling them things like that. That's the other issue, of course. Yeah. Well, they were the ones that figured out what to do. I just pointed them, you know, and, yeah, but and that's, that's cool. I, everyone's resource constrained. And whenever you hear someone, I get why people say it because can't imagine anyone working as hard as you're working because it's such you, you work so hard because you never have enough of anything to do what you need to do. And so after every race, you're like, my team works harder than every other team. Well, <laughs> I got news for it. Everybody's team is Everybody's working as team. hard as you yeah. can work. Yeah. The good ones are working hard on the right, more on They're the right efficiently problems, working hard. Yeah. More on the right problems. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, it's uh, and it, it's funny learning from different things. The one thing I learned in economics about opportunity cost is something I apply everywhere. It's, so it's like there are these adages. Well, whoever gets on the gas first is the fastest down the street. Ugh, yeah. And, you know, and so little things like this. And I'm like, well, maybe, maybe not. You know, it depends on the package, depends on this. Depends. And so what is the, you know, what are you trading for that? Like if you're in a low power car and you give up the whole first part of this 180 degree corner to get this perfect shot off on the street, yeah. yes. You're the fastest down the straightaway, and what you gain, the guy is making four times on the entry on you. Yeah, yeah. And there's a, there's another one of that. I had that same thing pop up on Facebook, and it was a really well known coach that does a lot of coaching, coaches a lot of top guys, and he, and he said that exact thing. He said, you know, in all of my coaching, he like summarized all this amazing stuff he'd done, and again, an impressive resume. In all of my coaching, getting on the throttle earlier is the key distinguishing feature of a driver that's faster than another driver. And I'm just like, oh my God, <laughs> because it drives, it's like, how about how the million things you had to do to position the car so accurately that you could do that? Maybe we should talk about that, you know, to, to, you know, to your point. And then, like you said, maybe that's not the quickest way in that particular car on that particular corner. You know, it, it's just like, it's just, bizarro world but you know you know what it's not that bizarre it's it's the human being's tendency to want to simplify everything sort of to my point where like ai isn't going to figure it out it's because this stuff is infinitely complex and you have to have this view of it where you know and, and obviously you have it and that's why i keep kind of throwing these compliments at you they're probably uncomfortable at this point but but i'm going to keep doing it because <laughs> you deserve it 
But <laughs> I know, right? Keep it coming, keep it coming. But it is, it is an understanding that there's, there's cause and effect with all of this. And everything you gain on, on, on exit, you lose on entry. To your point with the, I believe it was the Beretta saying that, you know, we, where it chewed through the rear tires. And so you were optimizing entry and mid-corner with that car so you could lean on the front tires a little bit. Like, that's, that's how you have to think, you guys. It is not... There is not one solution that makes you fast in a car. There is not one tip. There's not one anything. It, it, is, it is analog, and therefore it is infinite. And Steve, oh, Steve said a cool one. Steve Dynan said a cool one on, on the podcast. I'll say it again because it's totally relevant here. Everyone's like, what's the one thing I can do to make my car faster? You know, and he's like, it is a thousand things worth a thousandth of a second that makes your car faster. And I'm like, just, just chew on that. <laughs> Yeah. You know, stop trying to simplify things and magic re- pill. Give me the magic pill. Yeah, revel revel in the complexity of it. That's actually the thing you should do. And it was sort of like, you know, you were talking about how how you went and you tried to learn when Rory got the shock dyno and you're you're learning how dampers work and the knee and the platform and the low speed and the mid speed and the high speed and the transition and like all those things. And, and oh my God, it has a profound effect on how the car feels, you know, and they t- they're saying all these things and, and, but yet you go drive it and you're like, yes, more of that, you know, and, and that's not so good. You know, it, it is influ- you know, so influential on the car and how it feels to you and, and your ability to kind of go off in that direction, down that rabbit hole for a little while and, and wrap your head around it to an extent that, you know, that you have this now in your tool, tool book, right? Like you've got this now as a thing where you realize this thing you're feeling you don't like. And again, you don't have to go click a damper on a car. They're going to do it. But it, it helps you kind of picture the car in your head while you're driving it. And you can, you can start to see how to optimize the car. That's why that word's there, by the way, optimum, because it optimize is the perfect word for what we do. It's it, you could use maximize. Okay, that kind of works too. But it's never perfect. Optimize is just make the best of what you have. And that's what, all we ever did. Like, there's always limitations to everything, to testing time, to how many engines you can throw in and out of the car on a weekend, to how many chassis you have, to how many tires you have, to how many brake pads you have. All of that stuff, to, to how much brain power you can pull together. You're only ever trying to optimize your particular situation that day, that session, in that car, looking ahead to the weekend and trying to make the thing as fast as it can be by the time the race rolls around, you know, and put it in a decent spot and qualifying. You know, that's, that's what you were trying to do every single time. But I, I, I mean, everyone tries to simplify. And my advice is always just revel in the complexity. It's, it's amazing. And yeah, you've got to focus and all of that. But that's what experience has given you, hasn't it? It's given you that ability to sort of prioritize this infinitely long list. And yeah, most of the time you never get to the stuff lower than probably p10 on the list <laughs> but but uh but you know you know it's there and you know it's an influence and given the time and the testing there were probably times when you were you were a paid driver and you were kind of at the height of your career where and, and like you were just suggesting with the shocks where you kind of got to go down some of those rabbit holes and and learn some stuff you know and then then maybe your priority list shifted a little bit as a result of that but that's the cool thing about racing i keep going back to saying that's the cool thing about racing when i was talking about how, how, you know, it's a, a thousand engineers on a Formula One team and a guy that's as fit as a, tr- as a professional triathlete piloting the thing. You know, it's just a badass sport because of all of this, yet everyone tries to simplify it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> Well, I will, I will say, you talk about that thousand engineers, I thought about it when you said it before, and watching Elon Musk and the way he operates, I've never seen anyone outside of racing. I said, it's like he was embedded with a race team for a while because I've, I've said for a long time, if you've got an engineering problem or a problem that's really causing the world problems, you need to say, all right, guys, time out. No racing can take place until we figure this out. You want to fix that problem in a hurry and understand it well? You turn all that racing brain power and methodology yeah, and true. iteration ability. It, it's like nothing else. It's, it's, it's like nothing else. It's amazing what they can do and, and the speed with, with, with say, do it. You know, um, you got to be better every two weeks in Formula One. Yeah. You've got to be better. You know, you got to get better. You know, every other business, you're like, well, we need to uh, uh, four quarters from now, we can probably get this online and see if it's better. Yeah. Like, uh, no, no, we need to try something now for next week. I like I like how the last few races of F1, you know, you know, I mean, you know what's going on, like 
Red Bull hasn't upgraded their car in like 10 races. Why? They didn't have to. Why spend the money? They're spending money on next year's car. And yet the commentators are like, ooh, look, Ferrari and McLaren and Mercedes have caught up to Red Bull. You know, yeah. they're still dumping money in the current car and trying to get it closer. And, cl and it's, it's partly marketing. Um, but, we, you know, like we understand the reality. Like that Red Bull car is going to be so flipping fast next year. They haven't touched it in 10 races. They haven't had to. Everyone else is just going gangbusters trying to, trying to still seal second spot in the championship or second in the driver's championship. And Red Bull's just been coasting, working on next year's car behind the scenes. Oh, my God. Yep. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a problem. It's, it's a absurd. problem. <laughs> it's a problem. Everyone's going to be so <laughs> shocked. You know, when the first qualifying session comes out for the first race next year and that car is, again, a second clear of everybody, you know, and it, we know it's going to happen. It's going to happen. But uh, fun stuff. Yeah, one thing I wanted to, I don't know, we're getting close to what you have, but uh, I'm going to flip your whole thing about that beautiful speech you gave about Optimum. <laughs> I, I want to encourage everybody. It's easy to get caught up in. Technical side, it's easy to get caught up in an obsession over results. But one thing, it took me a while to, towards the end of my career, you, you want to optimize for enjoyments. Oh, so, you are getting old. You know, <laughs> yes. So, you know, all that stuff's important and, and, it, and it's more enjoyable to run better than it is to run poorly. But you can, if you're not careful, you can be so obsessed yes. over the results and the, the next one that you can be having, you can be doing really awesome stuff and, and still not be enjoying it. So I, I, uh, it's part of what again I talked about racers or professional complainers. You, you, it you know the good ones are, are miserable because they want and they want it to be better. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, yeah. the whole point of this exercise is to enjoy it. Now there's a secret silver lining if you can really harness that. Because if you really are optimizing for enjoyment, at the end of a race, when you're leading and there's a yellow, you're thinking, God, they sh I wish they would call this race. From a result standpoint, you want the race to be over. If you think back to when you were a kid dreaming about this, you're like, this is what I dreamt about. Two lap shootout for all the marbles. Yeah, I'm in front and I might lose it. But this is really why you got into it. So you become here, here, more Tommy immune to pressure. Here, here. If you're... If you're immune, if you're if you're folk, if you're having a good time, that's that's really that's a great great way to look at it. And I, I always, you know, I used to you know, but people and people can take that too far, and they just like I'm just in this for fun, and it's like you right. can derive fun from from being you know from applying yourself and and getting results and all that. That's pretty satisfying and fun. Just as you're saying, that two lap shootout is what you dreamt about as a kid. You know, it's like. You got you to gotta kind of, you know, what's the, the phrase, the Navy SEALs or the Marines embrace the suck at some, you know, at times just like yeah. understand that this is not easy or, you know, as, as Terry, you know, would say, uh, or, or everyone would be able to do it. Right. And, and so yeah. the, it's an understanding that, that this is like a really hard challenge. It's something to your point of how clever, you know, you want to world, you know, solve world peace, get a bunch of race car engineers. They're, they're pretty clever guys. Um, you know, this is this is something that attracts people with this mindset and philosophy. Uh, you know, like like uh, you know, bees to honey. It's it's like we love um, a challenge, and this is out of all the things that we could find in our lives. I, I I only think of like maybe like you know we talk about being fighter pilots. Sometimes you think of like the the Reno Air races, like the the guys that race you know five thousand horsepower P fifty one Mustangs and. Thunderbolts and, and Sea Furies and stuff like that. Like that's maybe the the closest thing to an equivalent, or maybe America's Cup racing. Um, that's that's a very high level of engineering in a very thrilling type of dangerous almost environment. But but racing is like that. I mean, it, it's this it's this incredible challenge that anyone that sort of has this curiosity you used that word really early on when you were describing yourself as a kid in your neighborhood. You know, you just that was me too. I was just wondering like how far I could push myself, um, you know, mentally, physically, all those things. I'm like, you know, how good can Paul be at stuff? That was, that was always the question. And you did it with athletics in school versus your, you know, teammates and different things you, that you would do throughout your life. But that mentality sort of carried through into what's the ultimate way to test yourself. And then you, that, 
you know, motorsports. <laughs> like, you know, it's the most complex thing that you're ever going to get to use in a sport is a race car. Um, and that's pretty damn, you know, fun to do and a pretty cool challenge. And yeah, it's kind of, you know, you can get bogged down in that. Totally agree. You can drive yourself a little crazy. I talk about that in, in, in the book a bit where I say, you know, we're all paranoid as race car drivers. We're always w worried about someone outworking us and out driving us and out testing us and out practicing us and out thinking us and all of those things. So we're always trying to push as hard as we can. But there are you, there is a, a mental health barrier <laughs> that's there where it can start having this negative impact in, in super simple terms. Once you mess with your sleep, you're not going to perform well. So as soon as it gets to the point where you're you're losing, literally losing sleep over this, you're actually yeah. hurting your performance in the car. So it's like that's a pretty good, easy way to look at it. Um, you know where it gets to be unhealthy. You know, and and um, you, well, and if you're not if you're not even if you're not actually enjoying the driving, yeah, because you're yeah. you're only thinking about going faster. Think about I I I remember you know I'd read about you know the, the theory of braking and apexing and maximizing the radius of a corner and so forth. The first time you actually heel toe downshift and match the revs and you get it all done, you turn in and you pick up that apex and you unwind your wheels and you feed in throttle. That, I mean, it oh doesn't get God. any better than that. Oh my so, God. Yeah. So don't, don't squeeze all that enjoyment out of that part of it. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I still like, I still like the, your, your version in the intrepid corner entry in a high speed corner. That's a better one. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, okay, as, you oh, you know, I, I mean, you think about it. Like I, I went and we did this, actually we did it. You should have come out, but we ran carts. The last Sonoma event we did um, this year for, we had yes. that, we, we went and ran carts. They were nice enough. We did a cart race. Yeah. And I, I hadn't been in a cart in quite a while. And the sheer joy of driving that stupid little slow four stroke cart around I uh, loved it. And to know Casey was trying to chase me and the rest of those uh, guys, um, it, it was, it, it's as good as anything, like literally as good as anything, like feeling yeah. that cart in a nice, tidy little, you, you, you use the word little, you know, an imperceivable drift. Like that's kind of driving nirvana is to keep the car balanced in that so tidy and neat. Um, and, uh, and just to feel that in a cart and I hadn't felt that in years. Now I'm like hell bent for buying a shifter cart over the winter. I'm like, I want a cart. I want to get beat up in a cart now. Um, it's just, it's just so, it's so pure, isn't it? That, that absolute joy of, of just connecting with that machine on such an intimate mm -hmm. level where, where you and it, you know, you can't tell where it, it ends and you begin kind of thing. Making it dance. Yep. Yeah. It's so, it's so, so yeah. good. So here, here's the last thing I... Because I am curious about this, um, and I want to give you a little bit of time on this, but you have raced against amazing drivers. Um, you have raced in amazing cars, and you have been in amazing races. Um, Bathurst, I want you to talk about Bathurst too. But in, in all the scope of the things that you've done, where, where, where did you kind of grab these little best practices things from, and what are they, and why? Um, That'd be kind of cool. So anything neat that you're like, oh, there was this, and you've said a few of them, to, honestly, already, but could you kind of run through a few of them, that what makes Tommy Kendall the driver he is, how you got there? Well, I mean, it's the overall approach is basically, I just ask why over and over and over, you know? So at first, you're just trying to get fast. You're like, find the, if you, if you don't have time, find the fastest guy, and do what he does. Right. You know, try to emulate it. Pull out and practice but right behind him. <laughs> if you ever want to beat that guy, you're going to have to figure out how to do it better than that. Yeah. So why is everything he's doing or everything his crew chief is doing? And so, you know, that's how you get greater under is just why, why does that work? Instead of, okay, it's great that if you do this, it, it's better. But why does that work? Because then when the variables change, you'll be able to. So that's an overarching sort of seek to understand what you're doing basically on a deep level. Um, and, you know, I mean, I guess there's some, some sort of fundamental best practices that I've shared in, in, in driving, like learning tracks. Um, and this is, it's more beginner, but it applies to everyone is work. I always work on the exits of the corners first mm -hmm. and then the entries, which is backwards, because when you go out and you attack a track, the first thing you get to is the brake zone, 
and then the entry and so forth. And, and if you attack that first one first, you're probably going to mess up the entry and then you're going to butcher the exit. And you're not going to know any better because you've, you've, never, you've never nailed an exit and so forth. Now, the better you get at it, you can do the that. Shortcuts. But if you yeah, yeah. really nail what apex out feels like, unwinding the hands, the sight picture, feeding the throttle, using up every inch of road, if you really nail that, and then you start trying to charge harder and carry more speed in, you're going to know when you start hurting that exit. You're almost and kind so, of reverse engineering the corner in a way. Yes. So that's, that's kind of a general practical, cool. you know, mental model or something that, that I've always done. Another one is, is braking, which, cause braking is so important. And um, this was a bigger, an even bigger advantage, bigger advantage. We had H pattern gearboxes. Because every time you were, you know, doing a downshift and trying to match the revs and, you know, every time we engage a new gear, there's a slight upset to the mm -hmm. car and it's changing the brake bias slightly. So I, I eventually went to where I skipped gears on downshift, which is sacrilege according to Senna. But I said, you know what, Senna's my hero and so forth, but this seems better to me, at least in the Trans Am car and so forth. And so I would only brake. And then I would do the downshift at the very end. And so what I would, uh, an exercise to try, and this helps almost everyone. You settle into sort of, you think you know a track, you think you know your car, and you think I can't go any faster. Now with data, you see it pretty quickly. A fast guy is really getting you under braking and he's you know ramping up the pressure faster. But what this really helps intermediate level people is after you've learned to track, after you've settled back in for a session, go out and in the big brake zones, stop at where you're braking at and think about nothing but trying to stop the car as fast as you can at that point. Don't think about downshifting. Don't think about the entry to the corners. I almost guarantee you, you're going to have the car slowed down early. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which tells you that when you are thinking about all those other things a little bit, you're subconsciously releasing a little bit of pressure or when you do your downshift and so forth. And so it's a way to check. And then once you say, wow, I stopped, I was at my turn-in speed 40 feet before the turn-in. Well, now you know you can go 40 feet, you, you can go deeper, maybe it's not 40 feet, but you can go deeper. And if you can do, if you can do it optimum. And so it's a way to sort of, you know, that's sort of a little like poor man's test on, are you close to max braking? Yeah. Um, you know, and just you know, the whole thing, just trying to understand, asking questions, find the people that understand it the best. And you can, you can figure it out all out on your own through trial and error, or you can shortcut it. You know, everything we do, you find the people and you, I mean, I guess it's a little bit of what this is about, but you, you know, find the people love to you know, answer good questions from earnest people, you know, and, uh, so uh, it's a great you know, way to build an to engineer. understand what you're doing. It's a great way to build an engineer relationship is, is sort of ask them what sort of their priorities are, what they're looking for in the car, what good drivers are they've worked with in the past and what made them think that they were good drivers. Like a lot of that with a new team or those are really cool conversations. Go take them out to dinner and just talk about that. Uh, but I, I love that part about it. I think that's a great point that you bring up to ask, ask those questions. And that was always with me. I was, when I was young, I was very naive and I, I didn't ask a lot of questions. I was, I was just too kind of ashamed to let people know I didn't know the answers to everything, you know, kind of thing. Uh -huh. And so, you know, better to keep your mouth shut and make people think you're, or let people think you're a fool than open your mouth and confirm it kind of mentality. Yeah. And, um, yeah. and so I think that slowed my learning curve on the technical side of things considerably. Um, and I think it's, it's you know, we, we were always, you know, we're so protective of our own um, egos and also we're afraid of what the team will think of us and, or, or people generally will think of us in a lot of situations that we don't ask questions that we damn well should have asked. And um, so I think we got to always come at this, you know, from having a bit of humility and, and realize that, that they know, <laughs> they know you don't know everything. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it's okay to ask so questions, ask not. questions. Yeah. Ask questions. That's one thing that's impressed me when I study, you know, Elon Musk and how he approaches things. With everything he's done, he's clearly brilliant. He he, he is totally open to being wrong. Totally. And yeah. now it, he has the luxury now of being acknowledged as a genius. And so it, it, it's not as 
hard for him or it doesn't look bad if he's wrong. But it's it's easy to the humility thing and you don't have to broadcast it, but you know, be honest with yourself about what you do and you don't know and, and try to try to fill those gaps. You know, we that's what's so great about spec series is you know, we're great at making excuses for ourselves to protect our ego and to try to protect our rides and so forth. But if you're lying to yourself, you're doing yourself a disservice. Yeah. So, you know, spec series, you know, you, if you're off, it's pretty much because you're off. Yeah. You but know? it's amazing and in a spec so, series how much people talk about, oh, he's got a good version of the spec car and I don't have a good version of the spec yeah. car. Yeah. <laughs> we're better Most tires. Most of the gains come from, from, in, from you, yeah. you know, yeah. and your development. Yeah. And so... Um, be honest with yourself, and yeah, it's 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 so fascinating and complex. Because that's real. If you're you don't want them to think you're an, you know, an idiot and shouldn't be there, so you got to kind of be a little guarded depending on the situation. Yeah. But um, when you're somewhere at a seminar or whatever, pepper them. You know. Yep. Let them have it. And and they. Yeah, I mean, you're there for a reason. Like if you're driving a car, you're you're there because there's a level of competence that gives them the confidence to, to, you know, put you behind the wheel of yeah. this car. And yeah, so I, they, they already kind of know where you're at or they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have put you in the car in the first place. So it's okay to, you know, talk about improving your craft. You know, it, it, it's something that you find, of course, anyone that's ever done this long enough, I think early on you think there's going to be a time where I don't really have to think about this much anymore, but you realize once you get into it and you've, you've got a decade or two or three thrown into this, you realize you never stop learning. Um, and you, and, and that's the only reason you've stayed competitive in the car. And, and that's the only thing that'll overcome, you know, you getting a little bit older and not being quite as quick on the reflex side of things and all of that is, is your backfilling with, with wisdom, hopefully that makes you, um, better in the car, more efficient in the car. And therefore you can keep driving the damn thing, um, and earn that right to drive the car because you, you know, you just, you keep getting better. So there's some offsets you're working against as you age <laughs> and that helps keep you in the game. That's certainly me, you know, still trying to pedal a car up Pike's Peak in a hurry. Um, you know, it's like, I need to keep bringing things to the table um, so that I earn that seat in that car every year, you know, and, and it's, it's great. I'm part of the reason the shifter cart's becoming a reality, you know, it's like, I, I want to keep, keep on point and make sure I can do that. Anything um, in particular in any categories, there were different styles required. You said that a bit when you were talking about the tire wear in the Trans Am car. Are there any other little things like that where you had to adapt what you were doing to go um, to get up into the front? Because that's the thing you always did, man. You always got in the front. Well, I would just say it, it's always a little bit different. And so, like, I always, I talk about Pruitt. Pruitt is so he drives so hard he makes so few mistakes but his style is pretty well defined and he drives about the same way everywhere and so and, and it's it's hard to beat but there were you know if if you say well the traditional approach works in nine out of the 12 corners here but in these three corners it's a little bit different and so Again, you can, there's a bunch of different ways to make it work, but just kind of always trying to, again, understand what you're doing and, you know, and, and that, that'll jump out at you. Once your understanding grows, you'll, you'll think about, oh, you know what? Like the, the whole, the softness about more grip, yeah. you know, when you move into a high downforce platform, you'll be like, well, that doesn't apply here. Well, it still does apply, but you, it's you, relative. you want it. Yeah. It's relative. Yeah. And so again, just trying to, and it, if you love it, which we obviously do, you know, but really press yourself to try to not just mimic what works, but understand why it works. I mean, that, and that applies, that applies to anything you do in life. Yeah, for sure. Um, for sure. Really. I always so. used to describe how, um, a, on like a racetrack, if you have really good engineers that they'll probably get the car to work pretty well in maybe half to two thirds of the corners. The car, the car is really well balanced there. And you think like through a stint, how you have degradation and, you know, the balance is going to change and all those things you're chasing. And, and you're really earning your money like on all those corners that, you know, sort of like the best compromise, I could get six of the 12 working really well or eight of the 12. And the car's pretty dialed in there. And it, you know, there's little problems in phases of each of the other corners that you, the driver, now need to fix. Like that's your job to optimize the car over a lap. It's your job to take this car that's pretty darn well balanced in, in, 
a majority of the corners, but now do that in the rest of the corners as well. That's where, you know, you've got to start earning your paycheck. And, and then again, as you said, setting up that car so you weren't out of bars <laughs> halfway through the race, you could keep chasing the balance of the car by adapting your driving technique and style at that particular moment with how, how the car was and also the mechanical changes that you were allowed to make within that particular race series to adjust the balance of the car. But that's, again, using that word optimized, that's how over that 100 miles of a Trans Am race or a four-hour stint at Daytona, you know, whatever it happens to be, um, how your average lap time over that stint is what you can get out of that car. Uh, and, and I think that's cool. It's, again, it just presents that amazing challenge, but that's where, you know, someone of your experience level where you've literally done all of those things for your entire life where, well, you, you, need, to, you need to write a book, Tommy Kendall. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's see the next let, let's see the the next uh, Mark Donahue uh, book come out of you because I think you've got almost got something like that in you if you ever wanted to do it. I've heard I've heard that before. I, it's <laughs> always something I say, yeah, someday. So we'll, <laughs> exactly. we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. I, I, I mean, I'm, mine was written because I I was just frustrated with how teaching was done. So mine's all on. Right you know, coaching and it's all about the human side of it. There's a little bit of engineering in there where there needs to be, but, but it was just a frustration with how it was, it was actually, you, you brought it up already, but you were talking about foundation. And I, I just remember Skip Barber school or the schools that I taught at where I, I, I timed it and people were getting eight minutes on the skid pad. And I was just like, no, it's not enough, you know? And then I, I got out unlimited time with people on the skid pad and I realized it took two hours to actually get someone comfortable on a skid pad where they had not only were they good at catching not only CPR silliness. It's not that that's not the racing part of, of the skid pad. The skid pad is the fingertips on the wheel, feeling the front end about to break loose. And also then the seat of the pants and the inner ear feeling the rear end about to break loose and being able to anticipate understeer or oversteer. That's the moneymaker. You know, and, and I realized like it took two hours, like in two hours I could do that. Even with someone, the old, the old analogy that I always use is like someone that got it as a gift certificate that lives in Manhattan that doesn't even have a driver's license, <laughs> right? Because you do get those they people. Might, they might need more than two hours. Lime, Lime Rock, you get those people. You know what those people would do? Um, you would go through lunch as well. That was my secret. So it was three hours, really. <laughs> And we're like, I guess I'm driving with this person through lunch. And then, but I'm going to get them there. I'm going to get them to that point. And, and so that's really how my book came apart or came about, came apart, <laughs> came together, the opposite. <laughs> it came together with me like getting to do the curriculums I wanted to do and then seeing the light bulbs come on and realizing they're, they used to use that phrase all the time, OSB, other sports beckon. And I, I used to hate that because um, I'm like, you know what? It's just... They're just coming at it with so much less experience than you, and that's not really fair to say they can't do it. You just, you know, maybe you can't teach it well enough to teach them. Maybe it's you, not them, you know. Yeah. So that was always my attitude, and I realized that everyone is teachable. And then I realized after that that literally everyone has greatness within them. Very few people have the dedication and the perseverance to see themselves to that level and that's where I was like, that's, that's the book. And then, then what gets the Tommy Kendalls of the world to that level? What did they do? What's their method? What's their, what's their process? And by the way, over the last two hours and 15 minutes now, you, you, you have, you've made that point for me. Thank you. <laughs> but you do know it to that level, and you, you did pay attention, um, you know, all of that. And so that's, that's why you have this wisdom that you have about driving a car. And it's kind of cool because if you think about it, like – you were pretty fast right away, right? I mean, again, not to pat yourself on the back, but here you go as a guy that's pretty fast right away, and still, every damn time you got in a car, you learned something, right? And there's, there's something to be said for that about this process where you, you realize a lot of people aren't really good when they first get in the car, and they're, they're just trying to get to you know some sort of level of competence where... They feel like they're not just stumbling all over themselves, you know, using the analogy of a dance partner. They're not just, you know, tripping each other at every step along the way and and, uh, and then trying to build something up beyond that. You know, so it's 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 an amazing thing, again, as a, a challenge for us as a human being 
to put ourselves through this process. And then, of course, realizing it's in this dangerous environment, it's high stress, and it's got an incredible cost associated to it. Everyone's looking at you, so, you know, you can't do it by yourself over in the corner. It's, you know, it, it's just like it's, it's about as hard and as, as amazing an endeavor I think a human being can put themselves through. So it's always super cool. Um, I'm going to, I'm almost kind of wrapping up here, but I want to make sure, is there anything else? What else, Tommy Kendall? What do you got for me? Well, I, I was going to follow up a little bit. I gave a little pep talk earlier about not getting discouraged. I'm going to, I'm going to do another pep talk in a slightly different vein. I love vein. this. Some people, some people take to this quicker than others. Yes. We see it in every AMG class. Some people have either have experience or just a real aptitude. It's the cool thing about this is if you apply yourself and you seek out good teachers and so forth, yes. you absolutely can become pretty darn good at this. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I make the comparison to golf. The golf swing is so complex. All the things that can happen to that club as it addresses the ball. Our, our sport is com complicated, but the controls, what we control is a steering wheel that turns left and right and shifts weight right and left and gas and brake that shift it forward and aft. And so it's, it's the difference between the best driver in the world that ever lived and the worst is how they do those simple controls. Yeah. But if you like this, stay with it because I've seen people that I'm like, that person is, this is not coming easily to them, <laughs> but they love it and they stay with it. And you years pass and you're like, that person's pretty darn good. Yeah, yeah. So I would encourage you to, and part of being a good racer is being your own shrink and not getting down on yourself. So if, if this is something you like, but you just don't think you pick it up as quickly as other people, that's just how you're wired. If you use the right processes and you get some good teachers and you practice, you can become good. So that's, that's my pep talk for the folks. Well, that's brilliant. And so Tommy Kendall, I want to thank you, sir. I've been looking forward to this for, well, since I started, thought about started doing podcasts, I knew that you were going to be like just the dream guest. And I think that's been the case because not only, again, not only do you have the experience, the true racing resume to be able to talk the talk, but how well you articulate the talk on top of that, uh, it's been really a pleasure. And I want to thank you and say, anytime you want to come on and do this again, you have an open invitation um, because it's been just, I think, just so cool. And I think for everyone that's been watching out there, uh, so useful to hear someone, again, of your level with your achievements, break it down so simply and, and realize, you know, we're all just putting our pants on one leg at a time. We're all working those three simple controls. And um, there's, there's a lot of satisfaction. There's a lot of joy. Uh, there's a lot of artistry. Um, that hopefully at some point some mastery, <laughs> but uh, it's, an, it's an incredible endeavor and uh, I think it does teach you a lot about life in general and it teaches you a lot about yourself and uh, you can have a huge amount of fun along the way. So Tommy Kendall, thank you again so much. Um, I'll see you at another AMG Academy event sometime soon, I'm sure. And um, Hopefully, my pleasure, but also kudos to you because you uh, you've done a great job at teasing, thinking about this in, in interesting ways and teasing stuff out and getting stuff out of people like me. So kudos to you too. Oh, thanks so my much. You're, you're too too kind. So uh, hopefully we'll see you again sometime uh, on the podcast. We'll certainly see you out there at the track sometime soon. And thank you again, Tommy Kendall. It has been a treat. Cheers.